Good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Nisrecki. Uh, I'm a professor of mechanical engineering and director of the uh, co-director of the RIST Institute for Sustainability and Energy. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Vice Chancellor uh, of Innovation and Research, uh, Julie Chen. Thanks, Chris. So good morning, everybody. And welcome to the University of Massachusetts Lowell and to the city of Lowell. What a beautiful fall morning we have today and it's great to see you all here. I'd like to acknowledge uh, some of our elected officials that are here joining us today and who, from whom you'll hear from a little bit later. I don't know if uh, Representative Tom Golden has, has arrived yet, but he certainly will be here um, in a few minutes. Representative Jeffrey Roy, I know is in the house. And uh, DOR, DOER um, Patrick Woodcock and uh, former Secretary Matt Beaton is uh, also here. We saw him earlier today. So thank you all for joining us. I know we also have uh, quite a few of our representatives in this hybrid workshop that we have. So many of the representatives are also uh, online joining us today. So we gathered here today this morning at a time that we all recognize is critical. Critical in terms of climate change, energy, sustainability, and critical in terms of how we think about it as a local, state, national, and global challenge. This week, a team of eight UMass Lowell faculty, students, and staff are in attendance at COP26 in Glasgow. And the one overarching message that we're hearing back from our team is that the complexity of the problem that we're facing, the challenges, the solutions, the opportunities that we must all address together is one that will face us and hopefully many generations will benefit from what we do today. That's why it's critical and from what you hear from the study and the folks here on the podium, it's critical that we have engineers speaking to economists, that we have political scientists talking to climate scientists, that we have researchers listening to stakeholders from across the spectrum. This is not a problem that is solved by a single group. This is a problem where, as a university, we believe that independent university research can help inform the decisions that you as industry leaders and as elective leaders have to make on the future of energy and sustainability here in Massachusetts and beyond. It's that commitment to the importance of independent university research to inform these solutions and the discussion and ongoing discussion that is why all of you are here today. For UMass Lowell, this is a topic that is a long-term topic for us. We have had decades of a solar and energy engineering program. On the operations side, we've, we've earned many leading by example awards from the state because of the programs that we have sought to implement. So this combination of research and action is something that is part of this university's vision. So today, UMass Lowell, and you're gonna hear about this in a minute from Rory, through the RIST Institute that Chris mentioned, the RIST Institute for Sustainability and, Ener and Energy is focused on how to take this cross-disciplinary approach, incorporating climate change, energy, and sustainability in an integrated way 
how are we going to do that as a way to solve these complex problems? And it's not by accident that UMass Lowell is the number one university for sustainability in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. From teaching to research to infusing the sustainable practices in our own operations as a living lab, we are creating a blueprint for organizations across the Commonwealth to follow. From the more than $37 million in research funding that our faculty have obtained, this funding enables us to train the next generation and to discover new solutions and explore new solutions to these problems. This morning's discussion on the draft study on the future of hydrogen for Massachusetts represents, as I said, mentioned, a viewpoint, the viewpoints of many different stakeholders engaged in energy and sustainability issues. Economic, political, social, technical, the breadth of issues all addressed in this draft report along with a call for continued collaboration and engagement between all parties. This document does not provide a concluding recommendation. Instead, it outlines the opportunities and challenges that the Commonwealth needs to address as we move to a low carbon future. It, identifies the questions that we all continue to need to discuss. And we view this morning's gathering as a jumping off point for additional collaboration. I'd like to also acknowledge Bob Rio from the Associated Industries of Massachusetts in the back and the foundation for their partnership in facilitating this effort. We are committed as the University of Massachusetts of Lowell to working with all of you and tackling these complex problems. And we know that our vision with the RIST Institute for Sustainability and Energy is it going to be an important resource for the entire Commonwealth. So thank you for participating, for listening, for voicing your thoughts and contributing to the discussion today and beyond. So with that, I'd like to introduce next Rory Omani, who is the executive director of UMass Lowell's RIST Institute for Sustainability and Energy for a brief overview of the Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julie, and uh, good morning again to everybody and a uh, very warm welcome to UMass Lowell and the city of Lowell um, this morning. So as Julie had mentioned, UMass Lowell is the number one ranked campus for sustainability in Massachusetts. And with the formation of the RIST Institute for Sustainability and Energy, the university is investing millions more in new clean energy research, new community partnerships, new degree programs and more to confront climate change. As executive director of the RIST Institute, I personally feel incredibly fortunate to be able to collaborate across the university and across the Commonwealth every day on our shared energy and sustainability goals. From my faculty co-director, Kristen Zrecki and Juliette Rooney Varga at the RIST Institute, to Commissioner Woodcock and his team at DOER, and of course, Representative Golden and the other members of the Lowell delegation, UMass Lowell is involved every day in the data, decisions and direction that are critical to our shared energy and sustainability goals. With the RIST Institute, we feel that UMass Lowell is taking a very innovative and unique approach in considering sustainability, energy, and climate with a view to breaking down silos. The whole driver be, be, be behind the RIST Institute is that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts, and it takes our longstanding expertise in energy, sustainability, and climate change and fuses them together, given the critical nature of this issue and opportunity. With that in mind, I think all of us here from UMass Lowell stand committed to Chancellor Maloney's vision 
of UMass Lowell and specifically the RIST Institute for Sustainability and Energy as a resource for the entire Commonwealth. As Julie mentioned, this is not an easy challenge for us to address. If we're to meet the state's climate goals, if we're to meet international and federal climate goals, we know that we have to collaborate together. This is not an issue or an opportunity for one organization nor one industry. And with that in mind, I'd ask everybody in attendance, both in person and online today, to view UMass Lowell as a resource. A resource for faculty expertise, a research for cutting edge research facilities, for incredibly hardworking and dedicated student interns, talented graduates that will make up the workforce of tomorrow, and UMass Lowell as the fulcrum that can pull together a lot of these collaborations and coordinations amongst our industry partners that are going to be critical to solving some of our biggest challenges. I think I speak for everybody in attendance that we owe it to everybody in the Commonwealth to collaborate on a fair, equitable and achievable future for all. This is a reason that UMass Lowell set, set up the RIST Institute and is investing so much in this institute as a resource for the entire Commonwealth. And we stand committed to helping because we know the collaboration and coordination is going to be the hallmark of how we meet these climate goals moving forward. So I'd like to introduce Chris Nisrecki, my co-director with the RIST Institute and the lead author on the draft study that we're gonna hear about today to introduce the panel and get us started on this morning's main event. And again, thank you so much to everybody for attending both in person and online. And we look forward to opportunities for further collaboration and engagement uh, after this morning. Thank you, Chris. So first thing I'd like to do is to thank uh, the sponsors of, the, of this event, this uh, in-person event. Uh, you know, we wouldn't have coffee and, and, and snacks and things like that without them and, and uh, the videography and, and such. So we uh, are grateful for them. Uh, we'd also like to thank our stakeholders. Uh, over the last uh, almost a year, we've been having interviews with uh, different um, uh, organizations uh, that span from the uh, natural gas industry, safety, hydrogen safety, uh, environmental agencies, uh, other uh, organizations as well. And so uh, this is a list of them. And uh, I'd like to thank them for uh, hearing, hearing what they have to say. And we try to incorporate uh, different people's perspectives and try to um, uh, identify uh, perhaps some misconceptions and, and, and try to find out some surprising facts that we weren't aware of. And I'd like to view today's discussion as the start, uh, the start of the discussion. And um, uh, at the end of the day, I'm, I'm hoping that you'll, you'll learn something that you haven't uh, heard about before. And uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so with that, oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so those are our sponsors. And they're also printed out back on, on your schedule and the stakeholders as well, sorry. We've, there's two, two clicker things here. So I've got to make sure I got to do both. And let me know if I'm doing something wrong fast sooner than, I, than that next time. Um, uh, so I'd like to introduce our, um, our authors. So we have a diverse set of authors. Uh, we have eight, eight of them here. Three of them are not here. I'd like to mention Hunter Mack, who's in mechanical engineering, David Ryan, who's also in Department of Chemistry, and uh, Fanling Chi, who's in uh, chemical engineering, who are not here today, uh, but hopefully online. Uh, the rest of the panel, uh, the names are, are here, so I'm not gonna specify their names, but it's a diverse set of expertise that spans um, knowledge in mechanical engineering from energy storage to combustion, um, to uh, fuel cells, uh, uh, to chemistry, uh, to economics. Um, so we have, and, and this is not a problem, this, this problem with hydrogen coupling with renewable energy and where do we go from here? It's not an easy solution. Um, and it requires a multidisciplinary team with uh, people from different ideas and different backgrounds and expertises. And so we had a unique opportunity from, um, uh, we want to thank our sponsor, also the AIM Foundation, who was uh, supporting this, this paper, the research study that we did, brought us all together to try to look and investigate 
uh, at this problem. So with that, let's try to find out uh, what uh, some of the solutions are, and we'll present those today. So with that, our first uh, speaker is uh, uh, a graduate student, Briar, Brian Hammerstrom. So Brian, come on up, thanks. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for coming to today's conference. There we go. So Massachusetts has relied heavily with the natural gas for energy production and with the need to reduce carbon emissions, there is this influx of renewable energy, especially with the offshore wind sector. So with that comes the opportunity for hydrogen production. And with hydrogen energy, there are many opportunities and uh, applications that can be achieved with hydrogen, especially in our transportation, in our thermal sector, and especially with our long duration storage. So with all of these applications comes sector coupling, which then provides a resilient grid and reliable energy source. So there are many different forms of hydrogen, which is used as a color coding. So we know how hydrogen is produced because we wanna reduce carbon emissions and we don't want to keep producing carbon. So gray hydrogen, which is the most uh, hydrogen produced. It creates 95% of the hydrogen today. It's um, produced through steam methane reforming or SMR with methane for every four carbon and for every one carbon dioxide produced, four hydrogen is also produced. There are ways to reduce the amount of carbon produced with this cycle and that's adding carbon capture. And this is known as blue hydrogen. Blue hydrogen is still being studied and whether or not it actually does reduce carbon emissions and greenhouse gases. So it may not be actually viable today, but for our study that we focused with is green hydrogen, which is hydrogen through electrolysis powered by renewable sources. It's a carbon free source of hydrogen. And then there are other lesser known forms of hydrogen like pink hydrogen, which is also through electrolysis and powered through nuclear energy. This may not be viable today, but it's still a viable, may be viable in the future. <clears throat> so looking at the world map, we can see, especially in Europe and then parts of Asia, they're booming with the hydrogen infrastructure. But then when we look at the United States and especially in Massachusetts, there's um, kind of this lack of infrastructure right now so we're not being able to use all the benefits that hydrogen would be able to provide today for that. So for our motivation, um, because of Massachusetts goal and especially the United States goal of being carbon neutral by the year 2050, there's been an influx of offshore wind projects as a part of um, Massachusetts energy efficiency projects. And with the influx of renewable energy becomes uh, intermittency and uh, problems with the grid which we believe hydrogen will provide this uh, resilient grid, as well as help to achieve the net zero goal of 2050. So for our paper and our project that we were trying to achieve was understand the opportunities, challenges, and concerns that hydrogen energy would play today. So for the basis of our study, we had 24 stakeholder meetings, which participated with a large number of multidisciplinary people, coming from a wide variety of backgrounds to really understand hydrogen and how people see hydrogen today. Then we examined peer reviewed journals and scientific papers, as well as looked at energy reports, national labs, research centers, and organizations. So to talk more about hydrogen, and especially with the long duration storage sector, I uh, introduce you to Professor Ertan R. All right, sure. Okay, so let's see. All right, great. Okay, hello everyone. So uh, thank you, Brian. So uh, yeah, my name is Artanar and I'll quickly talk about our key findings on the energy storage aspects of the hydrogen. So as Brian mentioned, the Commonwealth uh, has the greenhouse gas uh, emission reduction goal by at least 85% by 2050 and achieving net zero carbon emission goal by then. So to accomplish, to achieve this goal, 
So uh, our energy generation landscape started to, to change. So uh, gigawatts of offshore wind projects uh, are already being installed and we see more and more solar projects. So this is great. But now, so due to the unpredictable nature of these resources, so we are having an intermittency problem. So this problem has been known, but the thing that we like to highlight as part as a result of our study and all the all the stakeholder meetings, so this intermittency issue is on both time scales now. So we are talking about both the short time scales, which is like 15 minutes, 30 minutes, or, or a few hours. But more importantly, now we have seen the issue of like longer, long, long duration, like intermittency issue, which is like days, weeks, even like seasonal. So, so this is this is the this is the issue. And to address this issue, we need to identify an energy storage technology, a solution. So if you look at the available solutions, uh, it's clearly the, the front runner technology is lithium ion batteries. So it has been used uh, for for primarily for uh, the EV and the transportation sector and like the, the infrastructure problem, it's already been solved, which is great. So the initial thought is maybe we should use it for all the energy storage needs. So, uh, I mean, this, this makes sense, but if you look at lithium ion batteries, so there are like two key issues specifically for longer duration storage. So what you see on the on this slide, the, the bottom part, so is a, is a recent study done by International Energy Agency on the levelized cost of storage as a result of duration. And what you see is there. So whenever you pass like 10 hour, and if you are looking for like one day, two days, and even like weeks of storage, so lithium ion batteries, even like the, the other conventional technologies are not very cost effective. So, uh, and for specifically lithium ion batteries, there's a capacity fate issue and related lifetime problem, specifically for grid applications. And we are, like where we are talking about 10 years or 20 years of lifetime. Uh, and because of that, you know, like there is a cost effectiveness uh, issue, uh, but the hydrogen is, does not have that problem, especially like lo longer than a few, a few days and, and hours. So considering that we should look for like other solutions and, and we believe, you know, the utilization of hydrogen can be an effective method specifically for storing like large amounts of energy and for long duration for days weeks uh, either as a gas liquid and or in the form of ammonia so another problem specific to lithium ion batteries uh, based on their, uh, uh, their their availability availability of lithium availability of cobalt nickel so the graph that you see on uh, on this slide it's it's a very recent study done by bloomberg showing uh, the, the, the the demand of lithium which was like per year and what you see here is uh, the the lithium demand will reach approximately 2 million metric tons by 2030 so even with a very optimistic scenario of uh, having like extractable mineral deposits we are talking about like 50 million metric tons availability now so which creates some like pressure in terms of the the, the, the re, like providing the enough input for lithium ion batteries and there are like similar problems for cobalt and nickel so some of you might think oh how about recycling yes recycling of, of lithium can be can be considered but right now we are talking about 75 percent recycling efficiency so even with that like it's going to create some issues if you convert all the the cars into ev cars so uh, this is this is this is another problem. And finally, so I just like to conclude why like hydrogen could be uh, a, a viable solution for long duration storage. We recently conducted a techno economic comparison analysis led by my colleague Xin Fang Jin, who is also talk about it. So we have uh, this this study was done specifically for 15 megawatt and 72 hour uh, storage. And we have found out that so hydrogen is more viable and not only because of the, the, the less weight, less volume, we knew that because of its higher energy density, but it is more economical, like there's a more economical viability for hydrogen. So I think I'll stop here and I'll turn the floor over to my colleague, uh, Juan Pablo Trellis, who's gonna talk about the, the industrial processes. Okay, so let me start with industrial processes. Um, hydrogen is a most abundant element in the universe. So there is no, it is, it, sorry. Uh, I think you got it. 
Oh, sorry. There we go. Yeah. So hydrogen being the most abundant element in the universe, it is not surprising that you, we use it in materials, chemical, and many of the things that we use, right? In terms of industrial processes, hydrogen throughout the US is largely used in petrochemical products, right? For oil refining and methanol, uh, acid, and fertilizer production, and some others, right? From the processing of metals, a food processing where you see hydrogenation of fats and other materials. Now for Massachusetts industries, Massachusetts industries, right? They're largely rely on derived rather than primary feedstock, right? In Massachusetts industry, largely we rely on, on um, materials uh, and products that come from, that ha have been already processed from more uh, fundamental building blocks. So therefore the use of hydrogen in the industrial processes in Massachusetts has only a secondary effect, right? Nevertheless, this effect can be sizable. If Massachusetts industry produces, you know, uh, provide products and services, that rely from feedstocks that are carbon intensive, that, that translates into the net carbon intensity of the products and services that have been offered. Now, with that being said, right, this use of hydrogen industrially and through the US is largely relying on, on great hydrogen that you have already seen the definition, right? Currently, there are no incentives for a green hydrogen, right? So this is something that Massachusetts industries may have to address as we move forward towards net, uh, net zero. Um, so ther thermal heating. So thermal heating includes all home and com uh, commercial businesses, including agricultural and industrial activities that we just saw. Okay, the use of hydrogen for thermal heating can provide basically four, four essential uh, advantages, right? So it can prevent uh, stand stranded acids, basically you know gas pipes, right? So if if, if these are being used for hydrogen, then can facilitate the detachment from uh, natural gas, uh, provide flexibility to end users. For example, for residential, but also commercial users, right? If a commercial building that relies on, on natural gas for heating and have burners and boilers, right? Uh, switching to hydrogen, you know, giving some um, flexibility with respect, with respect to how to provide that heating needed. And of course, it provides energy resiliency. If we rely on an alternative uh, source to deliver our energy, besides electricity, uh, it helps offset the risk of just relying on, on a single source. But the primary advantage of the use of hydrogen for thermal heating is, of course, reduction in CO2 emissions, right? I mean, if, if we have in mind our, the state's goal of a net, net zero, and th this will be a key factor. Nevertheless, just by the characteristics of hydrogen as a fuel, and when we mix it with natural gas, the advantage in terms of carbon reduction is not, is not linear. As we can see, for example, in this table, right, the 5% blend will only achieve 1.5% reduction in carbon emissions. And if we go even to a 75% blend of hydrogen with methane, we still are achieving only 50% reduction. Uh, but th 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 this is uh, how it is and part of our findings. So implementing a hydrogen uh, for heating, well, there are a few challenges, right? Um, most there is, you know, the need for standards and guidelines, right, on the effect of hydrogen methane blends on gas appliances, from blend limits, retrofitting, redesign, and operation. And particularly here, we see on the, on the right side, these large-scale pilot projects, right, of the use of hydrogen blends in, in appliances. They have shown that, you know, up to 20% blend have no effect on end-user appliances. Uh, and in laboratory studies, you know, that, that uh, have been studied up to 28% blend, right? Uh, but blends about, you know, those limits, right? And certainly the appliances may need to be retrofitted or replaced completely. So that's regarding appliances. From the other end, right, regarding stranded uh, acids, if we use hydrogen in pipes, especially in cast iron pipes, um, they it will lead to embrittlement. And considering that the state of Massachusetts has roughly 21,000 miles of, of gas distribution pipes, uh, roughly 3,000 miles uh, are made of cast iron. Uh, just as, you know, to complement this, roughly 7,000 7, miles are of steel and 11,000 miles of plastic, right? Uh, so polyethylene and other strain steel pipes are most compatible with hydrogen, right? I mean, those will be roughly 18,000 miles of pipes in the U.S. in, the, in the Massachusetts. But those 3,000 uh, miles of cast iron are generally unsuitable to handle any uh, mix of any blends of hydrogen with a uh, methane. Okay, so we'll next proceed to uh, transportation. Thanks. 
Okay, so uh, in terms of energy consumption in Massachusetts, transportation is the largest of the sectors, and that's the, the one that's shown in yellow. Uh, sorry about that. Um, so that's the one that's shown in yellow. Uh, shown as well, uh, transportation likewise is the, the largest greenhouse gas emitter in terms of um, uh, any of the sectors. So uh, transportation industry consists of uh, shipping, shipping marines, uh, uh, consists of rails, uh, trucking, long haul trucking, uh, aviation as well. And it's because of the energy density of, high, of, of uh, batteries, um, uh, it's gonna be very difficult to electrify things like uh, ships or aviation. Uh, or even long haul trucking uh, for a vari variety of different reasons, um, and long as well as um, long haul freight and rail. So, what I want to do is focus more on uh, automobiles and talk about them because we're all fairly familiar with them. So, the question is: is uh, you know everybody, pretty much everybody here drove uh, uh, via gasoline vehicle here. And so uh, one of the handouts that you were given was a comparison of the safety between gasoline and hydrogen. And you can look at that uh, on your own. Um, but just to give you an example, about one kilogram of hydrogen has the same energy of about a gallon of gas. And all fuels have energy and um, can be dangerous if they're handled inappropriately. Um, over the decades, we've gotten accustomed to dealing with gasoline and how to handle that safely. And yet, um, across the country in the United States, there's 171,500 fires associated with uh, gasoline fires and automobiles. As far as filling stations go, uh, the average on average is about 20, 2,300 uh, fires at filling stations uh, um, uh, in the United States. So uh, again, the question is, we have a fuel and how do we handle this? How do we deal with it? And um, how do we deal with it safely? So decarbonizing all automobiles is, is, is a challenge. And so one of the, the ways potentially is battery electric vehicles. And battery electric vehicles are, they're efficient, um, but they have some challenges too that uh, most people aren't aware of. Um, so there is a material supply of lithium ion um, a, a supply challenge that will take place if we electrify all vehicles, automobiles, trucks, and things like that. Um, Jin Fang is going to be showing a little bit about that uh, as well. Um, there's a supply chain challenge. Historically, we've had a fuel uh, um, uh, supply cha challenge. If we move to an all electric uh, battery supplied uh, industry, as far as transportation goes, it's likely that there will be a supply chain challenge in far, as far as battery goes, because there's just not enough lithium ion on the planet to, to satisfy the needs. So that's one challenge. In cold climates, and Massachusetts is a cold climate, there's been several studies been, that have been, been performed. And in two of those studies, it had shown that in cold operating conditions, because you have to run a heater, um, the driving range for uh, electric vehicles has been reduced by about 40%. Um, so that is a challenge. Uh, now that doesn't necessarily happen if your your um, electric battery electric vehicle is plugged in through the night. If it is, then uh, your battery will maintain its charge. When it's operating, it'll still lose range. But um, one of the other challenges that exists is charging. So it takes about 27 to 60 minutes to receive an 80% charge. So this is. This goes back to convenience and cost. And um, uh, we are accustomed to filling our tanks in a few minutes. Um, so the, the question comes up whether, whether the public will accept this sort of uh, approach. The other thing is, is that uh, for residents who don't have access to uh, street park, access to plugging in their cars during the evening or, or maintaining the charge. So that becomes a challenge as well. And so, um, as an example, if you have a mid-sized city that has 100,000 parking spaces, um, and each, each charger costs about $1,200, which is about the average, not including 
all the wiring that's required to electrify those charging spaces. You're dealing with about uh, 120, million, 120 million dollars for uh, those uh, uh, parking spaces to electrify. So with fuel cells, um, I know I'm a little bit over. Oh, shit, sorry. Um, I'm sorry, I'm seeing it up here, but it's, it's, it's obviously a little bit challenging. Um, so uh, those are all the points that I mentioned just now, by the way. Okay. Um, all right, so the question uh, with uh, uh, hydrogen fuel cells, uh, a lot of people don't know about them, but uh, uh, there, are, in terms of fuel cell cars, uh, a common one is a uh, Toyota Mirai. Uh, in California, there's about 11,000 of these vehicles that have been operating safely. Um, they do not generate any NOx when they're, uh, or CO2 when they're operating. Uh, they refuel in about three minutes and their driving range is about 300 miles. Um, so in terms of, if you talk about the energy and the fire hazards associated with them, uh, a gallon of gas or a tank of gas is about, for a small compact car is about 13 gallons. Um, a, a typical a fuel cell car will be about uh, four to five kilograms of, of, of hydrogen. So the amount of energy, the flammable energy is about three times as much in a gasoline vehicle than a hydrogen vehicle. Um, so what happens when you have a rupture in a gasoline vehicle is, is that the, the gasoline wets the road, it wets the mating surfaces and can result in a fire. What happens when a hydrogen uh, tank ruptures? Well, it outgasses and the gas goes up and it dissipates into the atmosphere. So um, there's differences there. Um, so right now there's a lack of infrastructure in, the, in, in Massachusetts. Right now there's four, about 4,000 uh, public electric charging stations. Massachusetts has zero hydrogen uh, refueling stations. As I said, in California, there's about 11,000 cars operating. They have had no significant issues in terms of, of, of fires or that sort of such. Uh, Sandia National Labs did a study uh, on uh, uh, the safety of uh, uh, hydrogen electric, hydrogen fuel cell vehicles um, exploding in tunnels. And um, uh, it was found that there was uh, no significant uh, danger more than a gasoline vehicle. So uh, one of the things that needs to be reduced in order to implement hydrogen uh, uh, fuel cell vehicles is the cost of, cost of energy. So right now, the cost of uh, a kilogram of hydrogen is about $16. So to fill your tank would cost about $64. And that's more than a typical, uh, I, I paid 40 bucks uh, just the other day to fill my uh, Honda Civic. So there's a cost factor associated with it and the cost has to come down. And also there has to be an ener a green energy resource. So those are some of the findings. And how do we electrify? How do we de decarbonize the um, transportation sector? Well, it amounts to, for automobiles, it amounts to convenience and price. Um, electrification is not necessarily convenient for everybody, especially if you're driving for long hauls or if you don't have the patience to wait half an hour to an hour to recharge your cars. Not everybody can plug in at night. Um, so if consumers don't accept uh, that, then they're not gonna be off of uh, carbon neutral vehicles. Um, so, and likewise, uh, just uh, electrifying uh, the different sectors like uh, long haul trucking and marine is uh, a, a challenge. So those are some of the findings. We'll move on to safety now. Do a better job than I did. Thanks, Chris. So I want to uh, expand on some of these challenges and considerations with it respect to safety. Chris highlighted some of the ones relevant to transportation, but they're also broader ones within the context of consumer use of hydrogen within the context of the climate. And so I'll highlight some of those. And so there are some misconceptions, I think, within the context of safety and hydrogen. And many of these date to the Hindenburg incident in the 1930s. You know, this was there's this perception that hydrogen is uniquely explosive and uniquely dangerous. But as Chris mentioned, it's much like other fuels, where there are different considerations, but all fuels store energy. And so all fuels have different combustibility we need to think about. 
But there's a good body of evidence that hydrogen can be used safely. We transport it throughout the Gulf Coast. There are cars uh, driving up and down Highway 1 in California uh, fueled by hydrogen without any unique safety incidents compared to gasoline cars. And in a recent study, it was shown that there is uh, no additional damage, for example, from an ignition from a hydrogen vehicle versus a gasoline vehicle in a tunnel. So those considerations broadly paint a picture that we can think about within transporting hydrogen and moving it around. It's relatively safe comparison. But I'm a chemist, so I like to think about you know, properties. So what's different about hydrogen and what do we need to think about? So hydrogen is an odorless and a colorless gas. So that means we can't see it with our eyes and we cannot smell it. And so we need technology to detect, for example, a leak from hydrogen. Now, what's fortunate is to society, we already have ways to solve this challenge for another colorless odorless gas. So natural gas that we use to heat our homes is on its own colorless and odorless we add a molecule called methane thiol out there on the slide that gives it that slight rotten egg smell. That's how we perceive it from our nose. And so fortunately it was shown recently that you can use a similar strategy for hydrogen to give it that characteristic odor. So you could detect, for example, a small leak in a consumer use. Another aspect of hydrogen is that it burns a little hotter than natural gas. And so that means that the flame is actually bright blue instead of a bit reddish. And so under certain conditions, it can be challenging to see with your eyes. But that can also be solved by similarly adding these additives to give it a slight color that might make it, for example, reddish so you can perceive it. Another aspect we need to think about for all combustion processes and the generation of what's called NOx. So NOx is a family of gases that broadly contains NO, NO2, and N2O. And so these we generally want to avoid in combustion processes. So these are generated from natural gas and gasoline from hydrogen. And these can contribute to smog and acid rain formation. And so one consideration for hydrogen is that it burns, as I mentioned, at a hotter temperature than natural gas. And so that means it'll generate slightly more NOx. But fortunately, we have existing technologies and existing strategies that would allow us to mitigate either the creation of NOx or its release. And so there's two specific examples we could think about. Imagine a, a furnace. Well, you could lower the furnace temperature or add a bit of water to the ignition, and that would dramatically reduce NOx. So that would reduce its formation. But we can also mitigate its release. So as Chris mentioned, many of us drove here in gasoline automobiles. All of our gasoline automobiles have catalytic converters on the bottom. And this is old technology that was developed to mitigate NOx being released from our cars. So our gas engine generates NOx, but the catalytic converter means that it never gets released out of our exhaust pipe. And so this is a technological solution to make sure that NOx is never emitted into the air. So broadly, when we think about these challenges and we think about hydrogen, we find that there's a very positive carbon impact for hydrogen when compared to, nat to uh, natural gas or to other fossil fuels. So NOx in particular, when we think about that challenge, we already heavily regulate NOx. And so we probably need to update these when we consider hydrogen but um, this is already done through things like emissions tests. One of the things they're looking for is, you know, is your catalytic converter properly working properly? How much NOx are you emitting? Even um, when we think about the chemistry of hydrogen combustion in particular, the NOx it generates are NO and NO2, not N2O. And N2O is the really potent greenhouse gas. And so that's a fortunate uh, coincidence of chemistry for hydrogen. And when we think about hydrogen, even though it can be a weak uh, indirect greenhouse gas, it was fine that even in a very leaky pipe system where 10% of hydrogen is released through leaks, which is orders and orders of magnitude as uh, Shin Fang will tell us about more than we would imagine, there's still a 94% reduction in fossil fuel emissions through use of hydrogen. And this is because when we burn hydrogen, we don't release any CO2. And so finally, as we highlighted for fuel cells, this is where we take hydrogen and directly generate electricity with it. This doesn't generate any NOx at all. And so this can be part of a very carbon positive impact on uh, emissions and greenhouse gases. And so to tell you more about transportation of hydrogen and pipelines, I introduce Shin Fang Jin. Thank you so much, Michael. And I'm um, Xin Fang. I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, pipeline transportation. Uh, so hydrogen can be transported by a uh, compressed gas truck, uh, the liquid hydrogen truck, or the pipelines, or liquid hydrogen ship. And uh, uh, it has been proved that uh, 
pipelines is most cost-effective method to uh, transport hydrogen. And uh, my colleagues already showed that uh, by blending up to 20% of hydrogen in the existing pipelines, and we can uh, reduce greenhouse gas emission by 6%. And the house appliances at the end users can still uh, function effectively without any changes. And the, the risk of ignition and explosion only have a minor increase. But there are still a lot of challenges of blending hydrogen. And first of all, the hydrogen volumetric low heating value is one third of methane. Therefore, to, for the end user, we need to deliver two times more hydrogen and uh, to get the equivalent amount of energy, which will result in higher compression horsepower and additional e efficiency losses. And the second of all, the metering equipment need modification based on the blend ratios. And studies show that uh, up to 50% of hydrogen blend ratio, the deviation of accuracy of those metering equipments are acceptable. So those are the challenges of our pipeline transportation. And my uh, next slide is about uh, Massachusetts pipeline leakage. So in Massachusetts, we have about 22,000 miles of uh, main distribution pipelines for natural gas, and uh, which includes 50% uh, of plastic pipelines and 36% uh, of steel pipelines and 14% uh, of cast iron pipelines. So cast iron pipelines are incompatible with hydrogen. It suffers from a hydrogen embrittlement. And the uh, natural gas leakage rate, currently reported the leakage rate is uh, 0.0002%, that's our benchmark. And the hydrogen leakage rate is, hydrogen leakage is uh, happening through the permeation, through the joint threads, fittings, or through the pipe walls. And for steel pipes, it has been connected at the joint by those elastomeric materials, which have high hydrogen perme permeability so which will result in a factor of three higher of hydrogen leakage rate compared to natural gas. And for plastic pipes, the uh, leakage majorly occurring through the pipe walls. And a study uh, about the Dutch pipeline system showed that with a 17% of hydrogen blend, it will result in a 0.005% of hydrogen leakage. And uh, there's also research show that by coating a copper-based uh, epoxy layer on the steel pipe can prevent any types of leakage, either through the uh, joint or through the pipe walls. So overall, the hydrogen leakage rate is uh, commensurate, if not less, than that of natural gas. And so we should continually uh, change the regulations on methane leakage uh, detection. And also we should continually uh, repair the existing pipelines and to make it as low emission as possible. And that's my part. And I will hand over the presentation to my colleague, Kelly, for the economics of hydrogen. Thank you. So now I'm going to talk about um, the economics and policy part of this, bringing together a lot of the points um, that have already been discussed before to think about how hydrogen can play a role in our um, decarbonization strategy, particularly in Massachusetts. Can hydrogen be a part of this cost effective and efficient way for us to meet our decarbonization goals? Um, so essentially to start off, I just want to say that this is a, a dynamic problem um, that has many constraints, right? So we're thinking about 
in a dynamic way, how can we over time meet our decarbonization goals, given many constraints, um, including our budget constraints, our resource constraints, um, the speed of technological advancement, and the speed at which um, the public adopts these technological advancements. And so um, thinking about this sort of very complex dynamics problem, we think about can hydrogen complement other ways, particularly electrification, um, that can be used to meet our goals. The very um, first part to address is, is um, our hydrogen production costs low enough that hydrogen can be implemented in the strategy in a cost-effective manner? And um, compiling uh, research from many different sources um, into this diagram uh, made by economists, the answer is in the short term, yes. Um, that green hydrogen, which is mainly what we are interested in, hydrogen, um, as we know, that is produced um, via electrolysis, not using um, our carbon fuel sources, can be um, cost competitive with our, our natural gas, essentially, uh, with our uh, methods where we are using um, carbon um, to produce hydrogen. It can be competitive as early as 2030, certainly by 2050. Um, the drivers of this are, are two main things. First is we are having rapid technological advancements um, in the electrolyzer capacity. Um, there are actually a number of private firms, a number of whom we have talked to or spoken with um, that are making great strides in this. Um, the second that is very big is um, bringing down or, or what we've been able to do in bringing down the costs of renewable energy. Um, one big, big um, push in bringing down those prices of wind and solar um, has actually been tax credits at the federal level and at the state level that have helped bring these prices down um, even faster than many people have predicted. And so that's enable, that's going to enable um, us to bring down these production costs for green hydrogen. Um, another really important point is the federal government right now has a hydrogen program where they are trying to and, and funding as much as they can to bring down the production cost of green hydrogen to a dollar per kilogram um, by 2030 as well. Um, so again, what I mostly want to what I mostly want to talk about um, is how hydrogen can have a role in this decarbonization plan. And um, in almost any decarbonization scenario that we look at across the board, particularly in Massachusetts, you can read the quote in here, this is from our 2050 Massachusetts decarbonization roadmap, um, that we are still using natural gas through 2050. It is going to be very difficult to get rid of natural gas um, for a number of reasons, particularly because the cost of natural gas is so low. Uh, we would need to implement certainly some sort of policy um, to incentivize us away from using natural gas. Um, I will talk about this in a minute, but I also want to mention two other things is that hydrogen can be um, used, um, as Jin Feng talked about, in our existing pipeline infrastructure, which helps us to capitalize on some existing assets that we already have. And again, it can be used to complement electrification in places where it has shortfalls, particularly in storage, and particularly um, when we're thinking about the resiliency of grids. So as I mentioned, it's challenging. Massachusetts um, still has um, over half of um, households dependent on natural gas. Um, in some of these places, particularly thinking about how hydrogen can play a role in thermal, um, it's going to be very, very difficult to electrify um, some of these households, particularly households that are very old, um, for which it would be very costly to retrofit their homes um, with electrification. Um, we also see that um, electrification isn't happening on the time scale that it needs to happen um, to meet our 2050 decarbonization goals. Um, and there are many reasons for this. Certainly, we can step up our incentives um, to help meet our decarbonization goals with electrification. But um, part of the issue, like I said, is that it will be very, very costly for some folks, particularly lower income households, to electrify and to retrofit um, there are some um, buildings as well that are also with, with more complex systems that are going to be difficult to electrify. Um, the technology has been slow to be adopted as well. Um, there has been pushback from the public as well for people that like their natural gas appliances. So hydrogen can step in 
and play a role here. Um, finally, just two more things. We have existing infrastructure. Um, this is already put in place. For electrification, we are certainly going to have to build out um, a lot more um, infrastructure. Um, and like also with... <laughs> no, it's because I'm sitting next to you. Um, Complement to electrification, as we talked about earlier, is that um, electrification with electrification, we have intermittent energy delivery. Um, it is most a cost effective. The green line there you see as we move out for long duration storage is hydrogen. For long duration storage, hydrogen is the most cost effective method for storage. So we can use hydrogen to complement um, these periods. Um, when we use electric, when we have grids electrified, we can complement um, those periods periods of high energy and low energy um, coming into the grid. And one final thought is that um, I think it's particularly important to plan ahead for Massachusetts um, future when we're thinking about climate change and how we can make our energy delivery um, resilient. So we see here this is happening all across the United States, but um, natural disasters, their frequency and their magnitude are increasing. In Massachusetts in particular, we've seen a hundred, more than a hundred percent of occurrences of electrical outages due to nor'easters, um, snow, many natural disasters. And as we said, we have these pipelines underground already. Um, we're going to have to do a lot more um, with a lot more costly efforts um, to think about how we can make electrification resilient. So with that, um, we will talk about other applications. Thank you. Uh, so I will quickly summarize the other applications associated with hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen can be produced through gasification or paralysis of biomass with either controlled oxygen supply or without oxygen. So biomass typically contains about 5% or 8, uh, 6 weight percent of hydrogens and 50% more hydrogen can be produced from biomass gasifications combining with uh, steam reforming or water gas shift reactions. Hydrogen production from biomass doesn't contribute to carbon emissions um, because biomass is part of this natural carbon cycles. A study conducted for the state of Minnesota suggests that 89% of the gasoline can be replaced by the hydrogen produced from biomass gasifications. But in this state, there's no um, there's sufficient supply of biomass resources, and there's no existing facilities for biomass gasification to produce hydrogen in Massachusetts. Um, currently, biomass gasification of, is of high capital, operational, and maintenance costs. More research needs to be performed on assessments of carbon emission and economic assessments for the state. Hydrogen can be used to chemically hydrogenate carbon sources such as a biomass or even carbon dioxide to produce synthetic fuels, um, including gasoline, diesel, kerosene, and methane. So the opportunity of using thin fuels is that it can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions because carbon dioxide, which can be captured from the atmosphere, from the power plants, uh, can be used in the manufacturing process. So it's also compatible with existing distribution facilities, including refilling stations, uh, conversion technology without any significant modification to the system. So the facility to produce thin fuels are currently very expensive. Um, again, Massachusetts doesn't have the existing infrastructures dedicated to producing thin fuels using green hydrogen. So we expect that if we use green hydrogen, uh, we can significantly reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, so the path forward for Massachusetts would 
need to include more research on the production of thin fuels and development of green hydrogen infrastructures and market would further assess the challenges and economic benefits to the state. Uh, hydrogen can be produced and stored in the form of ammonia. Uh, ammonia consists around 18 weight percent of hydrogen and as an energy carrier, it doesn't require high pressure or low temperature storage. So it has even higher volume metric hydrogen density than liquid hydrogen. So ammonia can be liquefied under really mild conditions. This allows less energy intensive process to uh, store and transport hydrogen. Traditionally, fossil fuel derived hydrogen is utilized in the very high temperature, high pressure, energy intensive process called a Haber-Bosch reaction to produce ammonia. Uh, green hydrogen can be used to significantly reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, so currently there's no ammonia or fertilizer plants in the state and more research need to be performed on its economic benefits and assessments on the challenges associated with ammonia synthesis and fertilizers production um, for using green hydrogen. So next, Chris will present the summary recommendation and challenges. Okay, so um, let me conclude by saying a few thoughts. Um, you know, over history, uh, if you look at the slide on the left, um, it, it looks, where, where's our energy being coming from? Traditionally, it's been from wood. Uh, over thousands of years. Um, in the, during the Industrial Revolution, we've migrated towards coal. In the last hundred years, we've migrated towards oil and now natural gas and nuclear and hydro. Uh, if you look at the, the, uh, the top right of that graph on the left, you can see the green and the yellow. The green represents wind energy. The yellow represents solar. And so that gives you a measure of how much we're using right now. Um, it, it is going to be, uh, you know, flipping a switch to renewables is not going to happen overnight. It's going to be a process that takes decades. Um, if you look at the graph on the right, that shows, again, uh, where our fuels are coming from. And so the solid fuels represents the wood, the, the liquids represents the oils, and then where are we heading to? That's the question past the dotted line. Uh, certainly methane has been part of that. It's certainly cleaner than oil, um, but it's uh, where we, will hydrogen be embraced? Uh, the market's gonna determine that. And uh, um, also, um, you know, uh, public acceptance. So some final conclusions um, and recommendations Thanks, um, as we go forward. So uh, hydrogen integration provides diversification. It provides energy resiliency uh, for the Massachusetts energy source. In terms of uh, electrification, electrification should be considered as the first uh, consideration when possible instead of storing that energy from renewables in batteries or trying to make hydrogen. Um, if we can use electricity, then that's, our, that's what we ought to do. If we can't in places that it's hard to electrify or in vehicles that perhaps can't be electrified easily, um, hydrogen should be considered. So having a hybrid approach makes sense. Um, some places it's just not possible to electrify uh, for political reasons, for public acceptance reasons, or for uh, uh, just because of the infrastructure. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of, if you go through the report that we wrote, there's more detail, detail that's provided. But if you were in credit card debt and you were trying to get out of credit card debt, what would you do? You would cancel your highest interest credit cards. And so we're in a carbon debt. And so what makes sense is to start eliminating the highest interest carbon debt. Uh, 
that we have. And that means electrifying people who are using oil, who are using coal, coal or wood for their thermal generation or other reasons. The other thing is, is that we're at an inflection point in our society. And uh, you know, climate change is in the news perpetually these days, especially with COP just recently happening. Um, uh, immediate action is necessary. And so, uh, you know, policymakers uh, have got to make decisions that are proactive and immediate. So let's go through some of the recommendations from the study as well. Um, sorry. Uh, the development of uh, uh, an overall hydrogen, still? Okay, sorry. It's uh, counterintuitive here. Um, uh, the development of a hydrogen energy policy that integrates hydrogen uh, to reduce the or eliminate the intensity of uh, carbon fuels uh, should be considered. Uh, we should con continue looking at the advantages of green hydrogen within the transportation sector. Um, Reevaluate policies that hinder hydrogen transportation. So, for example, uh, cars, hydrogen fuel cell cars going into tunnels. I don't think it makes a lot of sense the policies that make that are uh, uh, currently exist based upon the science that's out there. Uh, we should also look at hydrogen for uh, long energy uh, storage. Uh, economically, the numbers seem to indicate that hydrogen makes more sense than using lithium ion. And likewise, there's gonna be a supply chain issue that uh, is facing the planet in terms of lithium ion. Whether there'll be other technologies that advance that replace lithium ion down the road, we don't know. Will hydrogen become cheaper? Most likely. Will lithium ion be replaced by something else? Who knows? It's hard to predict these things. But it makes sense to start investigating and preparing ourselves for a hybrid approach that includes hydrogen. Um, so another thing that can be done is to start doing pilot studies, some pilot programs uh, looking at um, hydrogen um, uh, programs for uh, distribution for LDCs, uh, replacing uh, existing methane gas with uh, blends of hydrogen. And uh, one of the things that we ought to do is to make sure that the, the current infrastructure that we know that we're gonna have for still several decades can we make it as low carbon emission as possible? And so uh, the cast iron pipes, they're the most leaky pipes and leaking out methane. Um, it makes sense to replace those with newer pipes that are compatible with hydrogen if we move towards a hydrogen economy and if green hydrogen becomes less expensive. There's a lot of ifs. Um, likewise, we're all, we're all anticipating this offshore wind resource to take place. And right now we don't have any offshore wind in Massachusetts. Um, it, 10 years from now, how much will we have? That's a good question. It depends upon what the policy and what the public demand. So another thing that can be done is the creation of a renewable procurement standard uh, for natural gas, um, similar to the electric renewable portfolio standard. Uh, so that way hydrogen can potentially qualify as a thermal renewable energy credit. So I guess what it, what, what it amounts to is that we're advocating for um, additional research, uh, additional investigation of the economics, um, because we've done preliminary analysis here, and including hydrogen as part of a hybrid approach makes sense for us. Um, and the science seems to indicate that. So with that, we'll end and answer any questions that you guys have. Thank you. So we'll open up the floor to questions and, and uh, I'm not sure who's gonna answer it, but it depends upon what the questions are. So, and we have a microphone in the back. There. So why don't we start over here? Um, I have a question about the amount of uh, hydrogen storage that we can sustain in Massachusetts. I know in other parts of the country there's underground gas storage, which is very good for long duration storage. 
I'm wondering uh, whether you have gone into some more detailed study about um, what could be used for long duration hydrogen storage in order to get enough of it stored. So uh, in other parts of the world, uh, there are, are salt caverns that exist that are more effective for storing gases like hydrogen. New England doesn't really have that. Massachusetts doesn't have that. So that's not an option for us. So if we're doing storage, that means that we're stored, storing in tanks cryogenically. So that means liquid storage, or we're, we're storing at high pressures in tanks as well. Hi, thanks for uh, your work. It's great work. Uh, Roger Prandenberg at Eversource. Question for you, uh, lessons learned from looking at Europe, for example, um, sort of your take on you know, things we can take from there. I know the Germans are doing work, the Dutch are doing work, uh, and then the Germans shared with me that the UK is probably most advanced in hydrogen management, transportation, and public acceptance. Any thoughts on what we can learn from them or cooperate with them? Yeah, so uh, I would say it's analogous to the offshore wind industry. Uh, in Europe, the offshore wind is industry is more advanced than ours. They've got thousands of turbines in the water now. Um, the United States only has five utility scale turbines off of Rhode Island. Um, so I think it's parallel what's happening in Europe re with regards to hydrogen compared to the United States. And um, there's lots of opportunity that Europeans see. Uh, and if you look at the, the, one of the graphs that we showed, all the activity that's happening in Europe um, and compared to what's happening in the United States, um, there's a huge difference between them. Uh, there's a lot to be learned from Europeans because they're ahead of us. My own. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. I'll jump in and say too as well that yes, they are much more advanced than us and Asia is as well. A lot of the studies um, that we do have that, that show us um, the ability for and use appliances to be compatible with certain levels of hydrogen are coming out of Europe. And I will say that um, the DOE actually does ha now have an effort um, to work with the Netherlands um, to share information and resources from there too. We had some questions over here on this side or over here, sure. Yes, I, um, Gordon Richardson, I live in Boston and, and I've been involved with uh, some energy projects over the last 40 years. Uh, I'm concerned about this push toward uh, putting hydrogen in our natural gas pipelines. Uh, I'm aware of a jury, uh, a peer reviewed paper by Horworth and, John, and Jacobson that shows that uh, putting blend, blending hydrogen into natural gas uh, actually is, is in putting it in, using it in heating applications, actually has a larger carbon, uh, carbon footprint than uh, burning natural gas or even coal. So I don't quite understand the energy or the carbon footprint argument for blending hydrogen into pipelines. Hydrogen has many, many important uses. And when we get green hydrogen, it will be in great demand. And I would propose that it should be used for the, in those applications where hydrogen is essential, where there are no uh, alternatives, such as producing ammonia, et cetera. Yeah, so when it comes to blending hydrogen, uh, it depends upon where the hydrogen is coming from. And if it's gray hydrogen or if it's brown hydrogen, um, it has a carbon footprint associated with it. Um, what we're doing is looking at uh, and, and in anticipation of this renewable energy resource that's go going to be coming online. Um, and there's uh, multiple companies and, uh, that have predicted that the price of carbogen, carb, green hydrogen generated from renewables is going to be cost competitive. And um, it currently is not, but it will be. But if you're putting in uh, hydrogen that's coming from brown hydrogen from natural gas or coal or something like that from SMR process of manufacturing, it's not, it's not as you said, it is more carbon, uh, it, it potentially can be more um, carbon, not, not carbon intensive, I guess. Um, 
So it, we have to be careful as we move forward to make sure that that's not the case in any kind of project that uh, there has to be a carbon balance that's done on any kind of project to make sure that we're moving forward. However, it's kind of like the chicken and the egg. You know, there's an industry developing and cost of hydrogen won't be able to come down unless there's sector coupling. Um, and in order for us to have a viable resource, um, we anticipate wind energy coming online. We anticipate renewables being part of it. And that's where the hydrogen needs to come from. So there's no answer to your question at this point, uh, other than if we, if we just took dirty hydrogen and put it in the, and used it and it's, there's, it's not helping us. Uh, Chris, I'm going to do a question from online. Sure. Just wanted to say to our online attendees, thanks so much for being with us. And if we don't get to all of your great questions, um, we'll try to follow up afterwards. But um, so this one came in kind of early on. Um, would you be able to discuss why the carbon reduction is nonlinear when blending hydrogen with methane? Michael, that's a good chemistry question. <laughs> you want, um, so it's a, it, it's, well, that's just the way it is. It's physically, that's what happens. Um, yeah, go ahead, Brian. Yeah, so the um, carbon reduction when blending with uh, hydrogen and natural gas like methane is not linear is because um, they have different energy densities. So if we wanna like reach that same energy, we're still gonna have to put in more of that blend level. So we're still going to be producing more um, <clears throat> methane and putting it in. So with that, there's going to be less carbon reduction. So with greater blends of hydrogen, that will then lead to that more like parabolic and greater um, uh, reduction with carbon emissions. So, so it amounts to the volumetric density of the, the, the fluids, right? So hydrogen is less dense than methane is. And so if you put an equal amount by volume, you're not getting the same uh, reduction um, so it's a nonlinear curve. Thank you. Great, great session. Steve Kona with beer. Um, one of the things I learned was, was, uh, pink hydrogen, which I wasn't aware of. Um, can you say, um, why you didn't take a look at it from nuclear and, sort of an economic question. We have nuclear plants that are shutting down because they can't compete in competitive markets. Is this a potential market to keep those non-carbon generating resources online? So for pink hydrogen, that's an active area of research right now. Um, uh, nuclear, just operating a nuclear plant is typically more expensive. And I think the answer is gonna come down to cost and, and uh, the economics of it. Um, so, if, if people think that they can make money by generating hydrogen through nuclear energy, then they will. The reason the plants are, are, are shutting down is because they've reached their, their age limit. And so um, uh, that requires renovation and you know, maintenance and that sort of thing. Um, uh, so I, I think it, it boils down to cost and economics. I think there's a perception issue with nuclear as well, that it's very, very difficult to get any sort of new nuclear up and running because of the safety perception. And that's a, a component of having them shut down as well. Can you use the microphone? Yeah, just to follow up, because I think plants are closing because they can't compete in the market. So it's an economic question for another. Some, some are aging, but the reinvestment. So you basically got... An existing asset that um, so I, I guess if they could make money they would but I'm wondering what the tipping point is there I don't see people um, yeah. so yeah. I'm a fan of nuclear um, you know I'm a, I'm a wind guy but I think nuclear is great in terms of carbon footprint it's more expensive um, and that's why it's losing out and same thing is true with coal and that's the reason we're we've eliminated coal not because most people are interested in carbon reduction. They care about cost. And, and that's what it amounts to. The market's going to decide. 
Um, hi, Audrey Schulman from HEAT. Um, I wonder, you know, first off, I think hydrogen is definitely going to be needed in so many different ways, and I uh, greatly appreciate a lot of this investigation. I wonder about, though, in pipelines, because so far as I can figure out, it seems to be from this presentation that it would have less energy per, you know, per in the density of the, uh, it's less energy dense, I guess. It's less safe. Um, there's health implications with NOx. And you'd have to switch out all the leak prone infrastructure and the appliances. And, you know, and so it's not only cast iron, I think it does also, and tell me if I'm wrong, bare steel and the older Adelaide uh, plastic. So I appreciate your answer. Wouldn't it, and sorry, wouldn't it be more efficient to store hydrogen and use it instead to produce electricity when needed? And then make heat, pump, you know, use it in heat pumps. It would be cheaper and more efficient. So there's like six different things you mentioned. <laughs> um, there's a lot, and, and, it, and it, it, there's a lot going on, and it's a multifaceted problem. Um, so in terms of the pipelines and those replacements, as we said, cast iron is not really suitable for for hydrogen, and uh, the existing steel, some of it has to be recoded. Uh, in order for it to be compatible. And it depends upon the blend level, of course. Heat pumps are more energy efficient than burning through a, a burner, you know? Um, uh, if we can use heat pumps, that would be terrific. However, there's challenges with electrification that take place. Um, uh, heat pumps uh, are expensive. Not everybody can afford them. Um, and this goes to public acceptance and cost. Um, and uh, so ground source heat pumps, I think there's lots of opportunity for, for that technology in certain places. But I think, again, there are certain sectors that hydrogen makes sense for. There's some places that it doesn't make sense for. When we're dealing with uh, the low hanging fruit and how do we get to carbon neutrality in the state, it makes sense to to tackle the low-hanging fruit first. Um, and let's electrify places that are using coal, that are using oil, that are burning wood for heat. Um, and as electrification happens, you know, the market's gonna decide. Right now, if according to our, our, our plan, the Massachusetts roadmap, we're supposed to be electrifying about 100,000 homes a year in, for, as far as heat pumps go. In 2020, we electrified about, I think 400 was the number? Four or 500. And so we're way, we're way behind. Um, you know, we're supportive of electrification, but um, it's, it's, it's gonna be challenging on how to make it all happen. And I, I, we think that hydrogen is gonna be part of it, part of the solution, but let's go after the low hanging fruit first. Uh, we're gonna take another one from online. I'm gonna try to combine a couple different ones regarding um, buildings and HVAC heating. Um, do you have examples of commercial or, or industrial buildings using hydrogen for HVAC heating? Um, how does it compare with the cost hydrogen versus natural gas? And are there any government incentives? So some examples, compare the costs and are there government incentives for um, HVAC? So there's green hydrogen is more expensive than other forms of hydrogen. Hydrogen using SMR is like least expensive and that's why industry uses it. Uh, the, the resource for green hydrogen is really limited. However, there are companies that have, uh, are looking at the analysis um, and uh, there's companies that are putting in solar farms and also wind, coupling wind with hydrogen generation to create a green energy resource. Uh, one of our stakeholders, whose name I can't remember, um, I think Mary, who is, the, I forgot his name, uh, the gentleman who is developing the hydrogen. Uh, is he here? No, oh, Okay, well, all right. Um, so uh, unfortunately, uh, that's an example of, of uh, pilot projects and projects that are, are, are happening right now to make green hydrogen less expensive. Um, uh, so, uh, well, there was two parts of the question. I think I answered one of them. I don't remember what was the other one. Oh, yeah. It was regarding HVAC. They were looking for examples. Okay. Um, um, 
cost comparison, a hydrogen versus natural gas, and if there are any government incentives so, towards this? Um, I'm not aware of any hydrogen being used right now for heating. Um, unless yeah, yeah, yes, there are no examples in the U.S. currently. HVAC and HVAC uh, in the U.S. No, there are no examples. There are pilot projects in Europe, uh, but the specifics. Uh, uh -huh. In, in, in Australia, but not in the US. So this goes to public acceptance. People fear the unfamiliar. And so if they're unfamiliar with the technologies, they're not gonna accept it. You know, the parallel is with the vaccinations. Other questions? Yep. And I love these questions. This is a great discussion and, and we'll have opportunities for further ones too. Yeah, thank you for the uh, the great presentation here. Um, Aaron Kempster from Energy Solutions. Um, I appreciated all the talk about blending in the pipelines and the um, the point that was made about needing to adapt the metering infrastructure to uh, accommodate the the blends um, was a point that I hadn't really heard before. Can you go into that just a little bit more? What would be actually required to either retrofit or replace the metering infrastructure at every endpoint using a blended fuel? I'm willing to wager that there are some people in the audience who can answer that question better than me. Um, uh, we know that depending upon the blend, uh, the metering is going to be changed because in order for uh, gas companies to make money, they, they have to um, mon quantify how much gas you're using. And so if you're using gas, well, the volume is different than it is not. If you're using hydrogen rather than natural gas, the volume is going to be different. So the volumetric flow rate of that is going to be different. And so therefore metering changes have to be made depending upon the blend rates. Um, so that's all I can say on that topic. We know it's going to be an issue. There's going to have to be some sort of metering changes that take place or the way that depending upon the blend, uh, things are charged. Hello, Peter Goddard from uh, MIT. Um, thanks for the talk, it's super interesting. So uh, in terms of the hydrogen injection, the 20% injection, what, from a practical perspective, what are sort of the major hurdles preventing Massachusetts from just piloting? It sounds like we have all, all the technology necessary to, to at least try it out. So it can't be piloted everywhere because the pipelines are not suitable. Um, at this point, um, and again, likewise, I don't think public will accept it everywhere. Um, I think it has to be introduced in a in a in a in a way that uh, there's some studies that are are done that uh, enable people to get comfortable with the technology. I think there's a lot of fear with regards to hydrogen, but again. Um, uh, if it's handled appropriately, it can be a safe fuel. Amy, why don't we take some questions over here on the right in the front uh, while we're while we're getting a question online or something? Just go ahead. Just one thing to add for a large deployment of pilot programs. Typically, those follow that the establishment of standards and guidelines, and we are still, you know, there's quite a bit of research going on towards those. They, these are not just yet established, right? So large scale pilot, you know, they are lagging behind this. Great study, great initiative. We did a uh, roadmap for Massachusetts in 2006. So it's good to see the industry catching up finally in the marketplace. Um, wondering about methanation, in other words, taking biogenic sources of CO2, for example, the wastewater treatment plant in Deer Isle emits 80,000 tons a year of CO2, combining that with renewable hydrogen to generate renewable natural gas. Had you considered methanation as a tactic or strategy? So that's it, it, a more detail of that about that is provided in the in the summary that we we we, we published. Um, we didn't talk a, too too much about it, um, but uh, what it amounts to is is that uh, you. You know, it's a balance. You're taking carbon from someplace else that would have maybe gone into the atmosphere. And then if you've got synthetic methane, syngas, um, uh, you know, ultimately that's going back into the methane. So you're not really reducing, but it's, it's sort of, you're not increasing either. Um, 
uh, there's, you know, I think multiple, multiple camps on, on, on that. Um, Michael, you look like you want to say something. No, I'm just agreeing with you, Sid. Yeah, there's, you could imagine certain cases where it's really challenging to electrify, really challenging to implement with hydrogen, where, you know, closing that loop where you're sort of making net emission zero could be a really good opportunity. Um, but I think it's really use case dependent where you actually envision that uh, fuel being used. So if that CO2 is going to be released in the atmosphere, can we use syn, syn gas or ammonia or something else um, if for ships, um, you know, in a place where we know that diesel is being used and um, adding to the carbon footprint? So it's not really, um, so I, um, it's, it's kind of neutral. Um, again, I think it's going to boil down to cost and, and the economics and whether it's the least less expensive or not. Uh, so I have more comments regarding the topic. So there's a, uh, there's a production site for the biofuel in Chile um, by Siemens and Porsche. So they project that using the green hydrogen from wind power, it can reduce the carbon emission by 85%. So keep in mind that 85 is not 100%. Yeah, so because this is very energy intensive process. Okay, um, so I think this is gonna be our last question. Um, okay, so um, when we talk about green hydrogen, we are talking about using renewable energy that would otherwise go to generation and using it for H2 production. Will we get to the point that we can have enough renewable energy to do all those things? Um, so if we are to go rely on renewables, um, there will be instances in which we have intermittency and there will also be instances in which we have curtailment and over which curtailment is basically an oversupply of electricity. And so what happens in wind farms and also for solar farms is that those they shut off those assets. Um, and so those are opportunities that we will have, you know, in, in, in the future, in the decades to come. If we're putting in all these 30 gigawatts of electricity that um, President Biden is, has a goal to achieve by 2030, there is certainly going to be times when we have an oversupply of electricity from renewables. And when that happens, there's plenty of opportunity for using the electricity for other things like generating hydrogen. All right, so we're, we wanna keep on schedule. We'll have an opportunity for more Q&A uh, in the next panel, uh, but let's take a, a short break and we'll resume uh, according to the schedule. Thank you, everyone. When would you like to uh, start? Right now. We are right on time. We are right on time. Right. <laughs> I'm trying to shut this off so I don't get caught in a hot mic. <laughs> I'm going to give everyone a few uh, moments to come on in and find your seats. Of course, the here we go. All right. Thank you all very much. Uh, my name is Tom Golden, state representative from the city of Lowell and the town of Chelmsford, and I want to welcome you to the center of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Right here, UMass Lowell. We've been doing, see that? <laughs> UMass Lowell has been doing some great work and I, I sincerely want to uh, give a shout out to our chancellor, Jackie Maloney, who has um, taken this issue on renewable energy and energy as a whole on. Um, uh, Dr. Julie Chen and her entire team has, has been doing an absolutely fabulous job ensuring that UMass Lowell is part of the solution to tomorrow. I am up here with a group of individuals that uh, I can say they're friends of mine. I hope they're still friends after I introduce them in a few. 
used to be friends. <laughs> but um, one of uh, one of my dear friends had just mentioned the fact that um, we are following the academics. And we noticed the academics are up front and all around. We're asking them not to ask us any difficult questions. <laughs> so at this time, I want to introduce uh, the current chairman of Telecommunications Utility and Energy, somebody who's doing a fabulous job, has been extremely busy over the last few weeks. And I know he's going to be tremendously busy over the next two weeks. And that is uh, a dear friend of mine, Jeff Roy, State Representative Jeff Roy. Thank you very much for joining us, Jeff. Another gentleman that I've done an awful lot of work with over the, uh, over the years and somebody who was really a, a true leader in the administration, someone who uh, no matter what always picks up the phone and always has something to say about what can happen and how to get to yes. Uh, and that is our commissioner, Patrick Woodcock. Patrick, thank you very much for joining us. And, you know, something Beacon Hill, never living within just one area of Beacon Hill, it's always dangerous for an elected official just to stand in the halls of Beacon Hill and, and listen to what's going on only in there. Um, that, as, as I've learned over the years, is something that is extremely dangerous. Um, and that's why we have people on the outside of the building who is always, the, people are always willing to give their opinion, their advice, where to go, what not to do, uh, and really how to look at it differently. And um, that's a, a dear friend of it, I, I know all of ours, somebody that we've all worked with, and that's Bob Rio from the Associated Industries of Massachusetts. Thank you much, Bob. So we're gonna be up here discussing a few things, but uh, I'd be remiss if I once again didn't welcome everybody here to the city of Lowell. This is a, a great opportunity for the city of Lowell, UMass Lowell especially. Uh, somebody was uh, at one point in time, many, many years ago, allowed me to come to this fine university, uh, not once, but twice. So I'm so proud of this. I'm so proud of the work that uh, all the professors and the doctors do here because they really are looking to solve the problems of tomorrow. Uh, th th they're looking to solve the problems today that, uh, are still going to be with us tomorrow, unfortunately. But uh, with nothing further ado, I want to introduce Mary Yusevitz, who is going to be uh, heading this panel and asking all the difficult questions and uh, kind of fighting back some of the questions from some of our academia, academic folks. So thank you very much, all, and thank you for being here. Mary? Well, thank you, Representative Golden. It's, um, I miss calling you chair. I do love the fact we have Chairman Roy, but um, I do love the fact that I worked closely with the representative and it's great that he is still very involved in energy because of his wealth of knowledge. I also want to um, inform you that Senator Barrett was on our list of presenters, but he was called away to Scotland. So he's there at Co COP26 with the delegation. Um, also from UML that's there. So I know they're doing important work and we hope to get his input on the study at some point. So um, I just wanna thank again our sponsors and I'd love if we could put that slide up because it is through them and all the stakeholders that we've been able to uh, get this conference underway. We had close to 200 people, not here in the room. We did do a hybrid. And so the rest of the people that aren't here are listening online. And so it shows that there's a tremendous amount of interest on hydrogen. So you're looking at a year's worth of work. I've made many friends here. And as director of business development, we hope that there'll be a future for hydrogen and help this industry grow. But what I'd like to do at this point now is just turn the tables over to our panelists and ask them an opportunity to comment on the study, particularly the seven recommendations that we had listed in the handout as well as on the screen. So I'd like to turn it over to Chairman Roy to just see his thoughts on what he thought of the recommendations from the study that the university had made. Chairman. Well, thank you very much. And uh, thank you everyone uh, for being here today. And I just wanna say uh, I'm delighted that uh, we are sitting here in a research university having a discussion of alternatives that are going to help us uh, address climate change issues uh, moving forward. And uh, I think it's important that we have those discussions. And uh, I'm particularly impressed with the very level of, um, uh, of interest that are part of this conversation today. Uh, ordinarily, these are silos uh, that uh, have their own conversations, do their own work, uh, issue a report, and 
uh, let somebody else take it. But the fact that everybody is in the same room having this uh, discussion uh, is incredible. Um, I will say I'm one of those people who came to this conference in a, uh, other than an, a gas powered vehicle, I came in a fully electric vehicle. Uh, so I was feeling a little bad because it's lithium ion batteries that power that. And uh, you were making me feel like maybe I did not make a good choice when I uh, purchased that vehicle in August. Uh, but uh, I took great comfort in the fact that you said that uh, lithium ion will not run out until 2050. Uh, I'll be 89 in 2050 and my kids will be taking away the keys to my cars at that time. So I think I'm good, but uh, it's great. Uh, I really uh, am excited about uh, the potential uh, for hydrogen, uh, particularly in the transportation uh, sector, uh, you know, uh, with the, the ships, the airplanes and, and moving people and moving materials, you know, batteries are simply not a, a solution. Um, I do actually have uh, two constituents in the room, which is amazing to me that they made it all the way up here from the great cities of Franklin uh, and Medway. Those are the other centers of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, but uh, one of them actually uh, introduced me to a hydrogen vehicle, actually two hydrogen vehicles, the Toyota and the Honda. And, uh, actually uh, invited me to drive uh, the hydrogen vehicle from uh, Franklin to uh, the state house. Now, it didn't tell me I wasn't supposed to go into tunnels until after I had gone through the tunnel, but uh, Charlie, we'll, uh, we'll let that one go. I didn't get sighted, but uh, it's certain, yeah, I guess that's recorded now. <laughs> but I do think, uh, Charlie, I think the statute of limitations has expired, so I think I'm good. Uh, but, uh, you know, that was, uh, that was a first introduction. And one of the things that uh, has been my focus, and uh, I know that uh, Lita Golden had indicated that I'm probably going to be very busy over the next couple of uh, days and weeks, uh, offshore wind has been uh, the central focus of my tenure as the chair of the committee. I took, took this chairmanship in February of uh, 2021. And uh, uh, the jury's still out as to whether I'm going to remain friendly with Lita Golden after he uh, gave me this uh, plum job. But, uh, you know, uh, the focus has been wind, 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 and trying to position Massachusetts to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. We have the most robust wind 14 miles off the coast of Massachusetts uh, in the entire contiguous United States. It's an opportunity that's waiting for us to harness it. And uh, we're uh, uh, going to introduce some legislation that will really position Massachusetts well uh, to compete in that industry. And I'm excited that hydrogen can be a part of that discussion uh, and the, the notion of there being uh, excess wind energy and what are we going to do with it? Uh, I hate to say, don't let it blow in the wind, but uh, let's capture that, use that excess uh, energy to, uh, to produce carbon, green, um, <laughs> that's another bad recording, uh, to reduce <laughs> green hydrogen, uh, because uh, there are so many uses of it, so we can build a robust wind industry and build a robust uh, hydrogen uh, industry at the same time. So I'm happy to be a part of this conversation and uh, happy that uh, I actually got to get out of the house for the second time since March of uh, 2020, so thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman. I appreciate your remarks. I'd like to turn now to Commissioner Woodcock, if he could give his, his impression on the seven recommendations from the UML study. Well, thank you so much, Mary. Uh, I want to thank my chair. It's been an active 10 months that we have been working together, and this is the first time that we have actually met in person. A um, wow. lot of Zoom calls. Uh, He's much taller than I had imagined. <laughs> Um, and uh, it's an, it really has been uh, astounding thinking of uh, joining the administration in 2017 to reflect on a new chair coming in uh, next to his predecessor of how much has altered in energy since 2016. And I think that's applicable in this discussion today. I think public policy, maybe rightfully, is always slightly behind technological change. And if we are gonna have uh, progress on decarbonization, we're always gonna have to look back on 
is our, our underlying uh, public policies open to this disruption that will need to occur? I think about when I hear the, the recommendations, and I do appreciate how this was a multidisciplinary effort. Um, we need that type of, of assessment to lay the groundwork for good policy making. Um, I'd say there, there are a few areas that I, when I think about Massachusetts' role in, uh, in climate change, there are a couple areas that I, that I consider. One is what are our comparative advantages to help globally this issue? And two, what are the economic opportunities for the Commonwealth? Uh, right now, I, I see uh, the, the real uniqueness of Massachusetts when we learn, try to learn the lessons from Europe is the seasonality of our energy demand. And it really is unique from, uh, from the developed world. We really are gonna start to see extremely low energy prices during seasonal periods with our huge influx of offshore wind. Uh, we have seen that occur in other markets with just solar growth in Hawaii and California. We're really at the cusp of creating a offshore wind and diverse energy portfolio that is targeted to our highest energy demands, but we'll have this excess power and how to utilize this optimally. The other area that I think about is uh, the decades old structure that we've had with the GCEP program. And I think it is, uh, I think we've all recognized that that was uh, providing an important primary goal of safety for our residents. I think we'll increasingly need to think about what are the lost opportunities as we put workers on the street, digging them up to ensure that we are putting in the type of infrastructure that can utilize as many forms of, uh, of, of new energy as possible, but also considerations of geothermal systems and also maintaining a safe and reliable system. Uh, that is the kind of crux of a docket at the Department of Public Utilities to look at the future of natural gas and how it fits in a decarbonized economy. I think the only area that I'd also highlight is the timeliness of this uh, with the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Uh, I think the Department of Energy across administrations has seen that hydrogen is ripe for research and development, and there are federal funds that will be available for competitive grants. And to think about partnering with either other states, uh, private sector, nonprofit, of how can we use federal dollars to, to set the course for where we want to see this type of technology and apply it in its highest and best use in Massachusetts. The other area that I have increasingly think that the federal government and the states need to work on is when we've had acute energy shortages over the last few decades, we, uh, and this has been something that has happened time and time again, we think about utilizing oil as our backstop. That is the, our safety valve. We have uh, the Northeast Home Heating Oil Reserve, which has a million barrels of oil uh, parked in Boston, parked in Connecticut, parked in New York, in a context of a vulnerability of oil shortages. That is really not what I see. That's not what keeps me up at night when I'm thinking about reliability challenges. It's acute shortages on our electrical system and our natural gas supply. And I do think we should take a reflect on whether that 1970s construct is really applicable in a decarbonized uh, future and where electricity will become an increasing part of powering the chairman's car, of powering our uh, homes for, uh, for heating and cooling, and uh, really is, will become a more increasingly part of our economy. So I think it's Im important, those are the areas that I think it, that I, as I hear the, the academics talk of applying it to where it's ripe for integrating this type of technology into our public discourse today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Commissioner, I appreciate that. Now, um, yes, we lost you as chair, but we got you into leadership. So from the leadership perspective, we would love to hear your comments, uh, Representative Golden. 
Thank you very much, Mary. Um, and then once again, I do appreciate everybody being here tonight. There are obviously so many challenges. Everyone is here for the same reason, to decarbonize. We want a cleaner and greener tomorrow. I don't think there's any question about that within uh, the four walls of, of this auditorium to the over 7 million individuals just in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. How do you get there? How can we indeed put, once again, another tool in the toolbox to make that happen? And I wanna say from the House of Representatives standpoint, we've been doing this with the administration, which I wanna you know, welcome again, uh, a dear friend, the commissioner. And I know the chairman's working on this, but when people were talking just a short time ago about the cost of offshore wind, we found that solution. We found that solution because we started listening to everyone. The challenges that were out there about eight years ago with the cost is now, and I'm gonna to look to the commissioner and the chairman, I don't wanna say they're gone, but we're doing a heck of a lot better than we thought we were going to do. That's why this is so important that we're here today to figure out the next tool. That's what's so exciting about this. And UMass Lowell being the institution that it is taking the leadership role and trying to make this happen. The sponsors that are here that are trying to make this happen. And you know, the interesting part is that uh, I believe the, the study, Bob, is not completed. We're here to listen. Everyone's here to listen to find out how we can make this better. And I know in talking to Speaker Mariano, then Lita Mariano, when we were talking about offshore wind, there were so many challenges and we're gonna work through those challenges to make sure that hydrogen could be, may be, should be, an opportunity for us in the future. And I'm just so excited because uh, honestly, for the, for the first 15 minutes, when I first got here this morning at nine o'clock, it was like old home week, running into so many friends and so many people that I know and uh, talking and they, they talk so highly about how hard the chairman is working. And I know that, you know, full tilt. But um, so we're here to listen as much as we are here uh, to, to take this in, to find out what is our next step. And I just can't say, Mary, thank you to you and thank you to Bob and thank you to the university for doing this today. Thank you, Representative. And the representative is correct. In my closing remarks, I'll talk about how and when you can anticipate getting the study. Um, we are leaving the study open. It is complete, but we're leaving it open for comments from today, from online, and for a couple of a period that I'll go over the details on. So we are wanting to hear it. We did have over 30 stakeholder meetings, but we always, as a university, are open to hearing um, diverse point of views and take them into consideration. So I'd like to turn it right now over to AIM Foundation. Before I get Bob to just comment, I wanna thank Bob for you know, trusting the university with the AIM Foundation to funding this study. Um, and I can't thank him enough, but I wanted to hear from Bob your thoughts on how this might integrate into the business community that is where energy is critical to the operation of their business. And do you see a, a, what's the future in terms of hydrogen for the business community? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. And I do want to thank you, Mass Lowell, and the chairman and the commissioner and uh, Representative Golden for coming here and giving their thoughts. And there's not a lot I can add beyond what they said, but I think businesses in Massachusetts and actually in the United States are looking for solutions. And they keep hitting walls when they try and decarbonize because not everything fits into the mold that's there now. You know, I mean, I mean, you can buy EVs and you can do this and you can do that, but there are instances where nothing is commercially available or even on the horizon for them to completely decarbonize. So the openness and willingness um, of the leaders here today to embrace a new technology and say, this might have something there to help our members, or I shouldn't say just our members, but the industry in Massachusetts, because we don't want people leaving Massachusetts be, because the prices are too high or the energy is unavailable. We want them to stay in Massachusetts and to come here because we have the first decarbonized economy in the United States and perhaps the world, I don't really know. Um, so the willingness to look at things and, and continually change your, your, your thought process because this stuff is changing quickly. And you know the day we put out this study, maybe we would sit down and say, hey, maybe we should do a second study because there's been so much new things. I've actually learned a lot just talking to some of the people here today. 
Um, this is not something that should just be put out and stopped. We need the leadership to keep pushing and saying, hey, maybe there's another study. Maybe there's an area we didn't look at. Maybe there's something else. And there's so many opportunities with hydrogen in all sectors of the economy that I think that once we bring in the offshore wind and ramp up the green hydrogen, this could be something that could really, really help Massachusetts get those difficult uh, to attain greenhouse gas goals. Because it is gonna be difficult, particularly with some of the challenges we've seen in the last few days up in Maine and other places. Massachusetts is relying on a lot of other states to help us meet our goals. And here's a case where we might be able to just do a lot of it ourselves. So going forward, I would like to uh, continue this open discussion, uh, continue flexibility. I guess when we put out a report or, or the, uh, the, the net zero report or the roadmap, we should probably print it in uh, some ink that goes away or something like this, because every time you print something, frankly, a month later or two months later, there's something else coming out. So that flexibility has to maintain. And I also think that with the right leadership, and I'm sure we have it here, Massachusetts could become the leader in research and development of this technology. So things that cannot be used here, you know, I think they brought up ammonia and fertilizer and sin fuels and some things that may not be particularly amenable to Massachusetts. Massachusetts could still be the center of excellence and um, support the research in those areas that other, other states and maybe other countries will look to Massachusetts for that, for that data and analysis. So thank you uh, for your willingness and openness. Well, thank you. And again, thank you to AIM Foundation. We wouldn't be here today without your support. So I'd like to go um, ask just a couple of questions and then we are gonna uh, go to the audience and also online. But every one of the speakers has brought up offshore wind. And I'd like to do a shout out um, to Chris, who's uh, heads up as the director of the Natural Science Foundation, WinStar. Um, it's the only NSF funded research center. Um, regarding when. And so this is actually where Chris and I had a conversation about how critical offshore wind is going to be to the energy um, development of the energy sector. But one major component of it, it is an intermittent supply, just like solar. And so what would be the storage? And I just want to turn to the panelists here because that's the conversation we had that made us realize that we needed to do a deeper dive into understanding that because we looked at the roadmap and it didn't really address it. So I would appreciate if we could get your thoughts on a long duration storage. If it's not hydrogen, what could it be? And how critical is long duration storage? So I'm gonna to turn to Commissioner Woodcock because maybe today you can feel free to announce who's gonna win the RFP. You know, we could create history right here um, uh, before December 17th. You're more than welcome to use this format, but you have another 1600 megawatts coming on, which is awesome. Um, but I think it is an important question we need to start um, asking and answering. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Um, I've learned long ago not to make news at these types of things. <laughs> Um, I, so a few, few responses to that. Um, the intermittency is interesting. Um, offshore wind is extremely intermittent in, this, in the sense that um, there isn't really seasonality to it. Uh, it is within a 24 hour cycle that you'll see production. We are seeing capacity factors of 45, 50% which is extremely strong. And that is uh, higher during the winter months where uh, we most need this energy in any sort of electrification scenario. I think there is a cautionary um, sense that we do not put all our efforts into offshore wind in that every technology has some limitations. I think we've witnessed in, in Europe, uh, and if you speak with the Norwegians, uh, the uh, our ISO uh, CEO has pointed out that Norway does have a two week period where they uh, store reserves that they could last uh, if they were not gonna have any intermittent renewables produced. I think long-term uh, we are gonna need the type of storage that provides multi-day uh, optionality. Um, and I did like the way that the, uh, the presenters previously talked about lithium ion 
hugely beneficial, but I, I see the benefits primarily in summer months and trying to integrate solar and con continuing to ensure that we can have growth of solar in onto our distribution system where the voltage requirements don't trip up our, our current system. We don't need to overbuild our distribution system. Very, in a severe cold snap, and we saw this in Texas, very few uh, benefits when you're having severe cold. So it's not about that this is a bad technology. It, every technology has some limitations. So I do think if we are gonna have an electrified scenario that is becoming, I think, uh, the likely scenario that we'll see for a decarbonized pathway, we will need to have that long duration storage for uh, a number of months to have that safety blanket because uh, we need to ensure that there will be reliability in this decarbonized future. Thank you, Commissioner. And I'll turn to Chairman Roy. Um, as Chris mentioned, we don't have gas, uh, we don't have the salt caverns. So um, we're looking at hydrogen to use it as a storage. What did you think of the study and the presenters in terms of their uh, findings regarding long duration storage being hydrogen? Well, I say I, I'm excited about the uh, prospect of uh, storage for hydrogen. And I, I will dare say that that is one of the uh, issues, one of the central issues that we're struggling with, uh, with offshore wind is to how are we going to uh, get it stored effectively? And, and I know the, uh, you know, lithium ion batteries uh, will provide uh, two to four hours of of, of energy and we need, uh, as, uh, as the commissioner stated, we need much longer term uh, uh, storage answers. And I'm excited about the prospect of hydrogen providing uh, that solution. And I'm also, uh, you know, uh, thinking of here we are on the verge of building uh, an offshore wind industry and could we build a hydrogen industry at the same time that uh, could provide storage, could provide the development of, of fuel cell technologies. Uh, there are so many uh, opportunities out there. And I know I've heard the, uh, uh, you know, some of the criticisms of, uh, of me even attending a conference like this. And I've said to folks, if you think for a second that I'm not going to listen to folks who have researched and studied this area, you're sadly mistaken because um, we need to uh, have a multi-tiered approach. And uh, as the commissioner outlined, you know, uh, not every technology uh, can solve all of our problems. We have to have a portfolio that's out there that's accessible to us uh, to provide the power that uh, people need. Uh, no one's going to accept if they flip that switch in their house, they won't accept it if the lights don't go on. So we need to provide uh, the capacity and uh, you know, storage is, is one opportunity. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about many of the uh, possibilities, not all of them, but uh, what uh, this research has, has developed uh, gives me hope that uh, we can develop uh, that portfolio that's necessary. Uh, for us to reach net zero by 2050. Uh, and you know, the reports that are out there are alarming of how imperative it is uh, that we act and that we act uh, quickly. And uh, I'm happy uh, to work with uh, great leaders here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts who get it and want to make uh, those moves and uh, are, are very open to uh, having these types of conversations. So I, I do wanna say thank you for including me uh, in this conversation because I, it, it's central to uh, the future of the Commonwealth and the future of the planet. And I like the fact that Massachusetts can continue to lead the way on these issues. And uh, I think uh, I've said it all along that uh, we have an opportunity uh, to be the number one state uh, for offshore wind, and we can become that cluster, we can become that hub. Um, I've met with uh, the folks uh, from the British consulate, 
to talk about uh, lessons learned. I, I'm happy that somebody uh, brought that up earlier in the conference today. Uh, they've been doing this for 25, 30 years, and uh, they uh, uh, are willing to share lessons learned. And they are moving ahead in the, in the hydrogen space, and they've got a lot of activity and a cluster they're building uh, in that area as well. So uh, happy to be part and happy that uh, folks are doing this work and they're doing it right here in Massachusetts. So. Well, thank you, Chairman. I'd like to turn to Representative Golden, because um, you were at the beginning of when we started building out all this solar and offshore wind. Um, you saw what prices happened when we built a market for renewables that 10 years ago, people said, oh, it's too expensive, oh, it's never gonna happen. So we'd like to change your focus now to hydrogen. We're at the same crossroads here where people are saying it's too expensive. Um, do you think that the Commonwealth could overcome the restrictions in the transportation, particularly about the tunnels, so that we can build a market to have competition in the transportation and not have it all just EV and that there could be a development of a market for hydrogen cars. Mary, thank you very much for that. Um, I truly believe we're at the tip of the iceberg here with this research and a first class institution such as UMass Lowell leading the way, it's nothing new to me. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to when we first started offshore wind and I ran into uh, Jim Eisenberg and Chris Eicher, and they're going to hate that uh, fact that I said this, but when we were really pushing this around, these discussions were real about money, about uh, one of the professors had said it earlier, that there's always a challenge about people want to do the right thing, but it has to be financially feasible. They want to get that done. We all want to breathe cleaner air, drink cleaner water. We want to do this, but it has to be something that we can concentrate on and ensure that uh, in the long run, this is going to be, you know, something viable. People think every day, and we see it all the time within politics and voting. A lot of times people vote with their, with, with their pocketbook, and they're very concerned about what, how this stuff affects them. So in, in mentioning the two gentlemen that I just did, um, these discussions were deep, Mary, when it was, when we were just discussing offshore wind. And quite frankly, it was very deep when we started to talk about storage, the storage costs, the storage issues, the challenges that we that still exist today. This is just another opportunity for us, I believe, um, for the cost of hydrogen, that that's why we need to continue to study this. That's why we need to continue to engage our institutions to make sure um, that prices drop. There was a time, and, and, and I'm talking history now, when people didn't think solar would go below uh, commissioner at 17 cents, 20 cents, I forget what it was per KW. And it was proven that it could happen. And, you know, I, I, the commissioner was there at the time, I was there at the time, the chairman was there at the time, and, and there was a lot of pushback. But competition is healthy, competition is good. And especially driving down uh, the cost, number one, but also making it cleaner and greener for all of us here today. So, you know, looking through uh, mass, Massachusetts is a leader in a lot of this. Uh, we have some of the best uh, research universities, one of them we're, we're at right now, making things happen throughout the Commonwealth. But I think it's important that we look towards some of our friends, as, as the chairman just mentioned, over in Europe. You know, uh, I had an opportunity to attend, uh, I was over in Germany and Denmark looking at this offshore wind stuff. And uh, the one piece, and I had shared it with a few folks today, we were sitting there afterwards having a cup of coffee, and somebody had mentioned to me, don't worry, just take it easy, go slow, you're gonna make mistakes. And I thought that was very you know, intuitive of the person because they had already made a whole bunch of mistakes. So they're like, relax, you're going to make mistakes, but at the end of the day, the product that you're gonna put out is going to be much better. I mean, what, what we're looking at now in offshore wind, I think we're going eight to 12 uh, uh, megawatts. Uh, some, of these, some of these turbines are getting much larger, bigger, and the cost is dropping like a rock. Our hope, I think, in ears wide open, is try to figure out how to get hydrogen to be in that spot. And if it's not hydrogen, which I think it may be, it may not be, what's the next piece? That's why research institutions like UML, that's why it's vitally important that we continue to push money into this research where, the, I'm gonna say the private sector that is out there can actually turn around 
and make this something that's commercial, commercialized where everybody is going to accept it, where at the end of the day, what we're doing is cleaning our air, cleaning our water, something we all want to have to happen. So I'm, a, I'm, I'm bullish on this. I think it's uh, something that we should be very excited about because it was just a, a short seven years ago, guys, when we were talking about this, uh, maybe eight on offshore wind, so. Well, um, and as you know, from all of our conversation on the first panel, we are as well. I'd like to um, just ask one question of AIM and then open it up to the audience and also online. Um, industrial use, we touched on it. Um, you know, we, we wonder, is there an opportunity for hydrogen to maybe play a role for the clean, for combined heat and power since that has now gone through a transition itself? Uh, and many of you may know that uh, there's about 100, 102 or three combined heat and power systems in Massachusetts. Many of them are, are in critical critical areas like hospitals, universities. I don't know if you mess a little has one. Um, does you mess a little has one? I know a lot of universities. I know I know a lot of universities do, and these provide critical infrastructure support for those places. Uh, we have several members that, frankly, would not be in Massachusetts except for combined heat and power because of the price of electricity. So uh, there's about 105 of them around there. And some of you may know that because they use natural gas under the new energy efficiency program going forward, that uh, the uh, incentives will not be available for natural gas fired combined heat and power, except for those that are already in the queue. I think there's four or five. And also under another regulatory review, that the um, um, credits will be declining to discourage uh, uh, further combined heat and power. So I think that when you have these systems, they can, they can be transitioned to hydrogen. I don't know if that's an easy thing to do, but it's certainly some, there are certainly people out there that could do it. Certainly they could uh, go into blends a little quicker. Uh, in fact, under our comments to the DOER on this, we, we asked for some leeway on the blend situation so that those who are using hydrogen could get some credits. And I think that's an opportunity for a hundred sources in Massachusetts to really transition to hydrogen, perhaps quickly. I mean, let's get some experts on this and see what has to be done. And I can guarantee you every one of those facilities would be happy to do it because every one of those facilities, hospitals, universities, and people like that have carbon goals that are gonna be difficult to meet if they don't transition out of uh, natural gas for combined heat and power. And they just can't electrify that easily. It's simply not going to happen as quick. So if hydrogen could be done quicker, effectively, safely, that is an area that I think we should, we should be pushing. Well, thank you, Bob. So now I'm gonna open it up to the audience to ask their questions. And Amy with the mic, I think we have some down here in the front. And then we will take also questions from the online audience. If you could just state your name and your affiliation before you ask your question. Hi, right, Brian Kuhn I'm with a company in Massachusetts, Plymouth-based company, Associated Energy Developers, and we uh, do solar and wind projects around the country. Uh, we're actually involved with three, uh, the development of three solar green hydrogen projects out in California. Uh, I thought uh, when I heard the words, we need the next tool, we're looking for the next tool, I could give you some insight as to what we find out there. It's, uh, it's very interesting. I think that um, peaker plants coming from the, to use the excess uh, hydrogen from, um, or electricity from offshore is going to be very big. But in California, what they've done is brought out a program called the HRI program. It's, it's hydrogen refueling infrastructure. And what this does is it provides a capacity payment for filling stations to stockpile, bring the hydrogen on the site so that they get paid even if they don't sell it right away. And what this does is twofold. It gets rid of the chicken and egg problem that the electric vehicles have had, which is I won't build my cars until the stations are there, and then I'm not gonna build my stations until a car market is there. So it's, it's setting the stage for this refueling uh, infrastructure, but it also provides the financing backstop that investors need to invest in the infrastructure and build out these stations and build out the hydrogen refueling plants. So I suggest you look at that. I think it's a very worthwhile uh, tool. Oh, thank you. That was very interesting. And we have another question here. 
Yeah, uh, half Micro. of it was taken, Micro-Ass UMass Lowell. It's about what we can learn from California about <laughs> refueling stations. But the other half is about, um, and anyone free to answer, what sort of scale or investment do we think is needed or possible to get these kinds of refueling stations in Massachusetts? Do we have the infrastructure, the will, the, the, the capacity when comparing, I mean, we can learn from California and, you know, the, the size of California is much greater and things well, like that. I'll try to see if I can ask Commissioner Woodcock, because um, I was, that's a good question, Michael. And I wanted to expand on the, the holdup of basically um, the fueling stations for hydrogen because of the restrictions in the tunnel. And I was just wondering if you could comment on that from the administration perspective. So I, I can't comment on uh, the bridge or the tunnel restrictions. Um, I will say, you know, it's an interesting, Massachusetts geography is very different than California. So um, in speaking with California, they do have some agreements with companies that operate uh, across state lines. And I think we'd have to be thoughtful about if we're going to dedicate public resources, how can we ensure that the utilization of that is occurring as much as possible in Massachusetts? If you can imagine the long haul trucks in Massachusetts, virtually none are registered in Massachusetts. Uh, that's different in California. Um, I think if you're if you're in my shoes, you look at limited uh, state resources. We certainly have, and we made a $10 million commitment to look at medium and heavy duty trucks to look at zero emission vehicles. That's available uh, for hydrogen vehicles, for, uh, uh, for EVs. Um, I think we do, and I work very closely with Commissioner Suberg of limited state resources. How do you know that you'll get it utilized? The last thing you wanna do is get something deployed that uh, is, is gonna sit idly. We do have two private facilities, uh, 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 fueling facilities in Massachusetts. I do want to look at the federal resources to see is this an opportunity to start looking at hydrogen infrastructure. But I think we're also going to need to hear from companies to say, if you put this in, we have incentives on the upfront cost of the vehicles. If you put in fueling stations, we will build out the infrastructure and build up a fleet to meet that. Uh, right now, we are seeing that demand on the EV charging. So uh, I, I would kind of challenge the industry here today to partner with with uh, the private sector to come to the administration and say, if you install X, Y, and Z, that we will start utilizing and deploying fleets to utilize that infrastructure. Thank you, Commissioner. And I think, uh, AIM, Bob, you would like to comment yes. on this? I mean, you know, we have Toyota as one of our sponsors. Uh, and speaking to Toyota, they are ready to implement uh, hydrogen fueling stations and work with state and federal and local governments to put in hydrogen fueling stations if the ruling could be changed. So I don't, I'm not speaking for Toyota, of course, but I mean, I think one of the holdups is that the laws simply have not caught up with the hydrogen vehicles. And so if, if that were to change and hydrogen vehicles were able to be used along the roads in Massachusetts, I mean, I would suspect there are plenty of private companies that would be happy to put in hydrogen filling stations in partnership with the state and local government. So, you know, I, 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 I'm encouraged by what Pat just said, which is, you know, public pu private partnerships. And if you look at our sponsor list, you'll see people in generation, you'll see people in transportation, you'll see people, LDCs, offshore wind, and I guarantee you every single one, none of those people that I know of own natural gas wells, and every single one of them is looking to supply Massachusetts with the appropriate resources to push our net carbon zero goals. And I think that meeting with them, um, particularly in the transportation sector, since that's what come up, I think you'd find that the uh, private industry is willing to partnership and really spend some of their own money putting these uh, charge, these uh, stations in, hydrogen stations, as some of them did on electric vehicles. And that coupled with some minor state resources and maybe some federal resources, I think would eliminate the roadblocks we have uh, providing the rules can change to make this um, the ability to use those vehicles on the roads. Okay, thank you. And uh, do we have a question from the online crowd? Yes, we do. Um, if hydrogen production and storage are new variables for the federal investment tax credit, incentivizing a preferred energy infrastructure, might the panel offer ideas on electrolysis at scale for large offshore wind and solar, 
to ensure ample storage capacities. Okay, well, I don't know if anybody here would like to try to take that one, but it's question, basically, how much do we have to have in order it to be a viable market? So my, my understanding is what you really need for electrolysis to work is low price per kilowatt hour consistently. And uh, I found actually one of the discussions about nuclear very interesting. Um, uh, it a lot of nuclear operators today are willing to offer very low competitive prices as a portfolio of their product for long-term certainty. So it'd be interesting if you could make the economics work for a portion of a nuclear power plant to have output in a 10 year to make, to justify the, uh, the investment in electrolysis. My head also goes to our partners to the North um, there's a reason why there's Bitcoin mining occurring in Quebec. The electrical uh, growth uh, that's occurring there, just pursuing pricing alone is really driving uh, a lot of that mining occurring in hydro-rich hydro uh, regions. I'm less clear that it would work on a kind of offshore wind uh, standpoint. Right now, all of our contracts are... Uh, developed with a long-term price per kilowatt hour of 20 years where the developer will maximize production. They get the same price per kilowatt irrespective of when it's producing. So you, what you would need to have happen is to have a developer start to see that the pricing in New England has reduced to, to a level which we are projecting, but have take the risk appetite that they would go on on a long-term basis to move forward with electrolysis operation. I'm not sure that that is enough of a predictable situation to make the economics work, especially given the seasonal variation of our pricing. Okay, and Chairman Roy, would you like to comment on that? Just because from a perspective of if we could get the transportation market and have a competitive alternative to just EV for the consumer, and we have all of this wind coming on, could we have then electrolysis be created enough to create this market for it? Well, I'm not going to answer the scientific question. Uh, I went to law school. Uh, I did start at Worcester Polytech uh, to try to be an engineer and realized uh, two years into it uh, that it wasn't going to happen. So uh, I won't give you the science answer. But you know, the federal government is putting $18 billion uh, out there for uh, research. And uh, I know there are companies out here, they're in Massachusetts, who are dealing with uh, electrolysis. And I think to advance that technology uh, and take advantage uh, of federal dollars that can go into this type of research, I, it's to me, it's a no-brainer. And uh, you know, we need we need effective uh, solutions, so, you know, to make it attractive for people uh, who may want to uh, drive a clean car, but uh, I can tell you, I, I had discussions with Charlie about uh, the decision about whether to get a hydrogen vehicle. It simply was, uh, you know, un unreal for me. The closest filling station was in Mansfield. I'm not driving 15 miles to fill up my car. Uh, and I don't know how many times I'd have to do that on a weekly basis, but you need this uh, this infrastructure in place. And uh, I was out at um, AstraZeneca a few weeks ago where uh, they only have 47 employees that drive EVs. And in their parking garage, they installed 250 charging stations, which will power 500 vehicles. That tells me something that they see uh, a, a, a wave happening that you know, if we put in this infrastructure, so, you know, if their folks live in a condo or live uh, in an apartment where they can't install a charging station in their garage, they had the foreseeability to put these charging stations in their garage so that their employees, when they come to work in the morning, can plug in and the vehicle be charged all day. It relieves that particular uh, crisis that they were facing. So these are innovative solutions that are uh, are addressing some of the structural needs we have out there with the EVs. And I would suggest we need to do the same type of innovation uh, with regard to uh, hydrogen vehicles and, and transportation. And if we do that and we make those uh, innovations, uh, then you'll create a market. Uh, I just look at uh, what Ford did uh, in creating uh, a market for electric vehicles. Um, 
you know, the, the, the vehicle that I drive is the Mustang Mach-E. Uh, it taps into a, a market that uh, otherwise would not have gone into this direction, but I think the most brilliant one was the, the Ford F-150. Oh my God, you're tapping into an incredible market. It's innovative thinking, uh, and that's how we're going to move uh, the public to make uh, these types of decisions. I know that's off of the hydrogen topic, but I think it gives you uh, an idea of uh, the type of thinking that uh, I think needs to go into this uh, space. No, and we appreciate that. And I'll just do a shout out that the federal government has also done an earth shot or they're calling it a hydrogen shot, that it's a dollar per one kg. So there is there is funding towards that. Um, do we have any other questions in the audience? Um, Yes. My name is Steve Jones, uh, and I wanted to focus on the, the proposed mi mixing of hydrogen with natural gas in the infrastructure. And I, th I think there's some problems with that. Uh, it's going to require a, a lot of investment to fix those 3,000 miles of cast iron pipe. It, it's likely that the homeowners or pe people are going to have to retrofit their appliances or replace them. It's also uh, an, an area that's of particular interest to me, and that is the problem of natural gas stoves. It's highly likely that uh, a mixture of hydrogen and natural gas will produce more in-home uh, air pollution associated with asthma. And the, the last uh, thing is, it's my, it, it, the hope is that we would have green hydrogen to put with the natural gas. It's going to take a lot of energy to produce that. I, my understanding is that if you, that you look the efficiency you lose a lot of efficiency uh, when you put it with natural gas as a thermal generator. And I think that uh, if we have green hydrogen, it has better uses than being mixed with natural gas. So this is a little bit of a joke, but do you think that putting hydrogen in the natural gas infrastructure is a pipe dream. Okay. Well, I'll start with the commissioner. We'll go down because this is one of the recommendations from the study. Would you like to comment, commissioner? Well, a, a few uh, responses to that. I think what we're seeing in, in Europe, and it stayed with me, is that um, you want to use uh, hydrogen for its highest and best use. And I think that's the point that you're raising. Another uh, point that I, I thought I heard from the academics here is that the, you know, that nonlinear uh, benefits of hydrogen that we may think about an application of integrating hydrogen in that it's geographically sensitive. So it may be that we look at a high percentage of hydrogen mix, but in limited geographic areas that are either very energy dense uh, that really don't make a lot of sense for air source heat pumps, BRF systems. So I think it's going to be a complicated, really, I, I, I always appreciate a study that says that there should be more study. <laughs> and I really do appreciate, because I do think that this is a complicated one. And I don't think it's as simple that we'll just say hydrogen should start being blended uniformly. Uh, I think that we'll start thinking about manufacturing processes, uh, maritime, aviation, it really is, um, there are a lot of unanswered questions and I think that's good to have academics start posing them. Chairman Roy. Well, Steve, I'll say it seems like you were eavesdropping on a conversation I was having with one of my constituents last night because everything you just uh, uh, reiterated was exactly what I was, uh, I was hearing in that conversation. Uh, but what we hear about today and, and I'm, I'm delighted to hear that there's a call for further research on this because there are some, some unanswered questions uh, that really need uh, further study. And you know, one of the things when I was initially briefed uh, on this report, 
uh, my concern was safety. And I'm glad to see that uh, a large part of the report addressed uh, some of those safety concerns. And I'm delighted to see that the, uh, the report continues to use the phrase draft because uh, you know, some of the conversations and uh, information that uh, is received from today and from further research will, will help us answer those questions. Uh, they're not easy, but um, I'll share with you uh, just, you know, just the, uh, a few weeks ago, and now I live in a community that is uh, largely powered by natural gas. Every, every, virtually every home in my community is a gas powered home. And uh, my wife and I were uh, walking the dog and she's the smartest person in my home and I will uh, never take that away from her, but we're walking and she says, you know, you're doing a lot of uh, work uh, in the energy space. And she said, look around as we're walking all these homes, how is the transition going to take place um, who's going to pay for all of these transitions and how long is it going to take to do this? And that's, you know, that's a, a pragmatic view of the situation we're in. So we have to look at every alternative that's out there. And I think as the commission has stated that if we can uh, do uh, certain, uh, certain installations in areas that it's uh, otherwise difficult to do, uh, then if that's an alternative, Let's do it. What's gonna get us on the path to net zero by 2050 in the most efficient and uh, fastest pace? So I, I'm not about ruling out uh, alternatives. Um, I think we have to take a holistic and realistic approach uh, to solving uh, this existential crisis. So I don't know if that answers your question directly, but uh, I, I welcome the opportunity for further research on that issue. And Representative Golden, you've been involved in the GSEPs for a while. Do you want to comment on that? Well, thank you again uh, very much. And I have to agree with what uh, the chairman of the commission was saying. We're in a draft form right now. How, you know, how are we going to get there? Uh, and I do love the fact that this says draft because, you know, we're really going to look at uh, the push and pull mechanisms that um, I know that uh, as a former chair and I know the current chair, you know, exercises when people come in with a better idea on how to get, how to, get to yes how to get to a cleaner uh, economy and a greener economy. So I do believe that if tomorrow we could change, let, let's say safety is not an issue, um, cost is not an issue. If we could change it tomorrow to hydrogen while we're, we're, we're making this bridge to uh, renewables, why wouldn't we try to do it? Why wouldn't we try to become cleaner, as clean as we possibly can tomorrow? And when I say tomorrow, I literally mean Wednesday. <laughs> you know, uh, there are so many challenges with batteries, with lithium. We need to really think of this. Um, I think the chairman just said it holistically. And 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 what's what's the reality? So, I'd be all in favor of of continuing the research on this, as I would be in favor of continuing the research on the next piece. What is the next piece next week? Who, you know, there are really smart people. Uh, in front of me, of course, but I've always said this. Not next. Year. <laughs> Not next. <laughs> you can tell we've done this before. <laughs> but um, I really truly believe that in our universities across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, those are the individuals that are going to solve this problem. We're trying to implement something that is real. We're trying to implement something that is going to make a difference. But it's those young men and women who are seated currently right now over at the university. Those are the folks that are gonna come up with solving this hydrogen, hydrogen issue, talking the difference uh, nuclear was brought up earlier today. Is it fission, is it fusion? All these ideas we need to kind of uh, grasp to hold on to this because we all agree, we need to be cleaner and greener. In 2050, let's try to do it in 2040. And, and that's, you know, let's try to get better quicker and faster. So uh, this research piece is, uh, is just the start of it. And uh, from AIM's perspective, what about the issue of resiliency um, uh, in terms of using that as a transportation 
Yeah, no, I just wanted to answer that question really quickly, though. Uh, one of the best parts of the study, I think, and the one that made me happiest was when I saw that it wasn't the rosy outlook on everything. I mean, they, we could have certainly written a study that said, hey, everything's fine. Let's go ahead and start doing this tomorrow. I think it is clear when you see the study, the full study, that you'll see the challenges and you'll see the obstacles that are current or the technological challenges and um, for things that you just said. And I don't think the study glosses over those and say that they're easy to fix or they can be fixed right away. And I think over time, as more hydrogen is produced, there's gotta be these winners and losers and it's gonna naturally gravitate to those areas where hydrogen is gonna be easily implemented. And I think what Pat just said is, is correct and what actually the other side of the table. How come I'm not sitting on that side of the table with all the smart people? Well, because they ran out of chairs. Okay. And then I would have been all That's along. what they always say. <laughs> um, and, you know, I think what, what was said over there, which is, you know, there may be opportunities to do this in, in, in certain areas and uh, certain industries and certain parts of the parts of the infrastructure. And I think that's really the takeaway here is we're going to be limited by the amount of green hydrogen produced for a very, very long time. And I think just naturally we're going to be using that hydrogen in the best places. And that could be in totally different sectors. It could be a little bit here, a little bit there. It's not all or nothing. There may be opportunities in each sector. Now, just to get to the resiliency, I, 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 you know, our members are concerned about resiliency for sure. They're all spending incredible amounts of money to maintain resiliency during all these weather events. And, um, you know, just what happened out in Cape Cod recently was, was unbelievable. You had Cape Cod basically being destroyed in some areas. And here I was in the North Shore and I just got a little rain. And, you know, we're going to see this where parts of the state are going to be hurt differently than other parts of the state. And I think it's important for the hospitals down in the Cape and the infrastructure down the Cape that needs to be there to service people's in the people in distress, those places have to be resilient. And the, to the extent that hydrogen can maintain that role, I think that's one of the prime areas we start with. Well, thank you. And I think we're getting to the end of the session. I first want to thank our panelists for A, coming in person and supporting our hybrid concept and being so open-minded to hear more about um, the research that we did at the university. I wanna thank all the authors. They've worked very hard for over a year. Chris and Rory um, for their tremendous leadership and giving us this opportunity as well as Julia Chang. And I wanna thank our sponsors and all the stakeholders. We had over 30 stakeholders that spent hours on the call sending us information. So the question is, yes, it's been mentioned several times that it is a draft um, because we wanna leave it open for further comments. There is a website called futureofhydrogen.org. If you'd like to send any information um, to that site on other things you'd like us to consider, we are leaving ourselves open to taking in all that information and giving it out to all of our authors and having them examine to see if we want to include those into this study. Um, upon that completion, you'll be hearing before Thanksgiving. Uh, we will send you, if you registered, you will get a link to the, to the um, report via email. If you don't, you can also go on the UML website and we'll have the link up there. You can also go on the AIM website, they'll have the link there. And we'll also have it on the Future of Hydrogen website, the link to the report too. Um, I'm Mary Yusevich, I'm the Director of Business Development at UML. My number is easily, I'll give my business card out. You can also call me if you want any uh, information. Um, but I'd like to do a nice applause for this wonderful panel and thank them for their time. And thank you for coming. I always pride myself on ending on high.